Council Member Perales will not be able to make it today. Um, so can we have the roll? Foley? Perales? Barza? Yes. Here. Owen? Here. And Davis? Here, and I think Foley just joined us. I'm yes. here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like we do not have any items to be added, dropped, or deferred to review the work plan. We don't have any items on the consent calendar, so we will go to reports to committee. The first item is stormwater permit reissuance. And I see both Jeff and Rajan. Take it away. Okay, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Please let me know if you can't see the presentation slides. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Jeff Sinclair. I'll be presenting today with my deputy director, Regine Nair. We'll be discussing the uh, status update of the reissuance for the municipal regional stormwater permit under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. But first, I'm going to start off with a bit of context on where our water goes. Starting with indoor activities like photo flushing, industrial wastewater, those activities go into our sanitary sewer system, which is directed to our wastewater treatment plant. That water is treated before being discharged into the bay. Whereas outdoor activities, which is what this permit primarily covers, such as irrigation, um, car washing, or just rainwater, these all flow into the separate storm sewer system, which discharges that water largely untreated into our creeks and river before those uh, water bodies uh, reach the bay. So San Jose is actually fairly unique. Uh, we have a lot of these creeks and 26 distinct creeks and streams. We have 136 miles of, of these creeks and streams much of which are in fairly natural conditions and support native fish and wildlife. And they also serve as an important community resource. So when stormwater or these other outdoor activities, and stormwater is the same as rainwater, when, they, when stormwater falls and, and hits impervious or hardscape surface and it's unable to infiltrate or, in, or percolate into the ground, it'll run off into our storm drain system. As it does this, it picks up pollutants like oils and grease, metals from cars, uh, pesticides, and even trash. And it carries all of this pollution into our creeks and, and creates a, essentially a toxic cocktail for our fish and other wildlife. And it damages the habitat. As a result, there are regulations in place to prevent the stormwater pollution. The Federal Clean Water Act requires that states, such as California, operate National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Systems, or NPDES permits, which California administers on a regional basis. So San Jose is a part of the San Francisco Bay Regional Permit. This is a five-year permit that requires the city as a whole, as part of their capital and operation programs, to implement programs and policies to ensure that our activities both on the public side and private side, do not uh, create pollution or direct that pollution into our creeks. San ESD is responsible for tracking and reporting on those activities that uh, our other departments largely implement. So our five-year permit term has been extended. It began in 2016, and it was extended till the next permit is reissued. It was scheduled to... Um, Labs on, on January 1st, 2021. But right now, water board staff are working on the uh, the new permit, and we've been in discussions with them over the past year and a half or so. They're proposing changes that will greatly enhance the amount of effort uh, that we will be doing to improve our creeks and water bodies, 
but it also put some constraints on our resources. And so we'll be going over some of the major changes and the major provisions uh, that they're proposing for the next permit that most recently have been uh, shared with us through an administrative process. The changes are being proposed to uh, primarily the C3 new and redevelopment provision, which I'll be covering, the C10 trash load reduction provision, which Reginald will be covering along with the C12 PCBs provision. And then we'll also be talking about a cost reporting provision and an unhoused water quality impacts provision, which uh, are new to this upcoming permit. So as I mentioned, I'm going to start with the C3 new and redevelopment provision. So this regulates new and redevelopment. So when projects come in and disturb a certain amount of area, they're required to treat that. So what I've got on the screen here is a table that shows the current permit requirements along with the new proposed requirements and or the changes and then uh, per the project type. So under the current permit, majority of projects that are 10,000 square feet or more of newly created or replaced and purpose surface are required to include treatment. Water board staff are proposing to reduce that threshold down to 5,000 square feet, which will bring in more projects uh, that will be regulated by this requirement. It'll also include that the public right of way areas that are being redeveloped as a part of that, if they are being redeveloped as a part of that project, also include treatment. So under the current permit, single family homes are largely exempt, unless they're part of a larger uh, development. But under the new permit, if a single family home project creates or replaces 10,000 square feet or more impervious surface that where the stormwater could run off, uh, they'll be required to also include treatment. Roadway projects under the current permit already have requirements for treatment, but maintenance has largely been exempt. In this next permit, they're proposing significant maintenance projects that are an acre or more in size that largely just disturb the base. They, they go down to the base rock below the pavement. Those are the projects that would essentially need to incorporate green infrastructure as a part of this process. And so under the current permit, San Jose developed our first green stormwater infrastructure plan, which provides a lot of the tools and guidance to uh, ensure that GSI gets implemented on these different project types, as well as uh, initiated by the city like the grants. And so in the next permit term, the water board really wants to see implementation occur outside of the, just these requirements. So they're requiring um, 10 acres per the administrative draft, but they've indicated that that actually may go up significantly uh, with the final draft. So what are the impacts of these changes? Well, one thing is we'll have a lot more green stormwater infrastructure, which is a good thing because it'll improve our water quality in our creeks and also provide all the multiple benefits such as increased urban greenscape, uh, reduced heat island effect, as well as improved air quality. 99% of the projects 99% uh, of the green infrastructure in the city of San Jose is a result of these requirements. But while there are some benefits, there are also going to be costs associated with these benefits. Development Services uh, estimates that it's about $27 per square foot for green infrastructure uh, as part of development projects. And so then now extend into the right of way into these lower threshold projects. We also worked with DOT to understand what the pavement maintenance requirements um, might be as far as an impact goes. And a conservative estimate uh, shows that it could be $79 million that would be needed for green infrastructure to be incorporated with these projects. Looking at three-year pavement maintenance program for those projects that are severely deteriorated that they would need to restabilize the base rock as I indicated in my earlier slide. So with all of these additional requirements, we also have the additional permitting associated with them, inspecting, tracking, and reporting that goes along with that. All of it takes time and resources. So I'm gonna pass it along to Reginald to carry on the rest of the presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee and public. My name is Reggie Mir, Deputy Director of Watershed Protection Division in the Environmental Services Department. So the uh, other provision in this permit uh, that we wanted to highlight is the C10 trash load reduction. Uh, this specific provision requires the city to meet 100% target of trash reduction from the municipal storm sewer system. To date, the city has maintained compliance under this provision by implementing a combination of controls. We've installed 32 large trash capture devices um, and also 138 inlet screens. Uh, we've established ba two bands that uh, reduce hard to break down materials in our creeks, such as plastic bags and polystyrene. We removed over nine, uh, approximately 983 tons of trash that's been picked up from last fiscal year uh, within our waterways through creek cleanups uh, and the council approved direct discharge plan, which was a, developed through an interdepartmental effort in partnership with housing, parks and recreation neighborhood services and environmental services department. And lastly, uh, implemented several online programs that provided trash reduction credits. Uh, since 2019, under this current permit, the city has been able to exceed the 80% target in trash uh, reduction and still remaining uh, maintaining compliance. Next slide, please. So now with the new permit, the water board is proposing to remove its existing credits for source control, like the bag bans and the offset of the direct discharge program and creek cleanups that I mentioned in the previous slide which will result in 35% reduction to the city's current percentage. If this happens, the city would be required to find and to fund alternative uh, methods to make up for the lost 35%. So it can be ensured that the city can meet 100% reduction requirements for the permit and ultimately for the city to be in compliance with the Federal Clean Water Act. This will likely include additional trash capture devices and various on-land programs. When we met with the committee last fall, the Water Board originally set the deadline of 100% trash load reduction by 2022. Um, as shown on this slide, they have proposed to shift the deadline back to 2025 and created an interim target of 90% by 2023. Um, the, ex uh, the other part of this particular provision uh, that we want to highlight is existing and new private developments that are 10,000 square feet or larger will be subject to also large tra uh, full trash captured requirements on those sites, but a smaller version of the trash capture that we've installed in the past as shown on the slide on the top left. It may also require programmatic activities like litter removal and city oversight to ensure that the activities achieve full trash reduction. So what this may potentially mean, and uh, next slide please. Um, so what we evaluated the potential impact for this provision from an equity standpoint, um, the requirement has the potential to increase significantly new costs for local businesses. Um, to install a full trash capture device, um, the potential cost for design, installation, inspection can exceed over 133,000. Um, also, the impacts for the trash load reduction requirements on private lands will not be distributed equitably. Uh, we found that approximately 74% of the 1,400 parcels that are 10,000 square feet are located in the three lowest median household income ranges, according to the San Jose Equity Atlas, shown in the graph here um, below, and also on the map on the right shows where uh, are highlighting the red parcels where they're located throughout the city. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next provision we wanted to highlight is C12, polychlorinated biphenyls commonly known as, uh, referred to as PCBs. PCBs are toxic and exist in unhealthy quantities in the San Francisco Bay. As such, the Water Board has assigned a particularly high priority to PCBs in the permit 
since urban stormwater is thought to be the primary pathway of new PCBs loads into the San Francisco Bay. Baywide stormwater permittees are required to reduce PCB loads by implementing a variety of control measures that would include structural controls such as large trash capture devices and green stormwater infrastructure, as well as programmatic controls such as street sweeping and inlet cleaning. Properties that are known to be sources of PCBs can be identified through significant investigations and the administrative draft will require the city to increase the amount of investigation to identify more source properties to the water board. However, a challenge presented by water board staff is how to manage PCBs in areas where it is dispersed and not linked to a specific property. The administrative draft includes a requirement to implement PCBs controls in old industrial areas that may have some concentration, but no clear evidence or in a unidentify or identifiable sources of PCBs. This would be a countywide requirement to address approximately 600 acres, much of which would fall within San Jose, since majority of the industrial areas are in city's jurisdiction. This presents potential costs in the millions of dollars range that the city would need to spend to implement the control measures described and would impact public works led GI, uh, the green, uh, green stormwater infrastructure implementation and then trash capture device installations in addition to Department of Transportation operations and maintenance activities. Lastly, we, uh, as Jeff mentioned earlier, we wanted to go in more specific and highlight the two new requirements in the future that's going to be permitted, um, that's going to be included in the permit uh, for cost reporting and unhoused community. With regards to the cost reporting, while the details of the cost reporting requirements have not been presented specifically, Water Board staff expressed interest in uh, considering categories of costs to be reported, such as staff consulting installation, operations and maintenance, and some administrative costs. Um, permittees have proposed allowing more time in the next permit for a framework to develop with the water board approval that would outline consistent methodologies, expectations, and guidelines for collecting and reporting costs. Uh, with regards to uh, the, the other provision that they're adding is the unhoused community. Federal, state, and regional agencies, as well as non-governmental organizations, are expressing significant concern over the unhoused living along the waterways, which affects multiple environmental regulations. California Fish and Wildlife and the Federal Clean Water Act do not allow anyone residing along creeks that could potentially include, uh, that could include potentially or actual discharges. Water board staff are more concerned that the homelessness that can result in water quality impacts to local waterways and are exploring ways to incorporate requirements in the next permit to address these impacts. 90% of the trash within San Jose creeks originated, uh, originate from unhoused community living within our waterways. And as I stated earlier, the city's direct discharge plan uh, was developed in partnership with housing and the uh, Parks and Recreation Neighborhood Services was intended to address this specific issue. Um, they, uh, the Water Board is proposing for cities to take action and broadly track and report requirements related to homelessness data, actions taken, and interdepartmental coordination to um, help address this concern. Lastly, in the next slide, please, Jeff. Um, so for the next step uh, for the new permit rollout, staff will continue to participate in regional work group meetings with water board staff and other co-permittees to discuss potential changes for the next stormwater permit. Shown on this slide is the updated schedule recently presented by water board staff that may be subject to change. The tentative order will be another opportunity for a comment on permit language, and there will be a board hearing, which is tentatively planned for October of 2021. This is an opportunity for San Jose to communicate directly with the water board prior to permit approval. 
The permit was planned to be effective July 2021, but then has shifted to July 2022 due to delays in its development. This is a new, new change overall for the Water Board because traditionally the permit would be uh, typically a, a effect um, by January, but now the Water Board is uh, moving this to align more to a fiscal year. The current permit has been extended until the next permit becomes effective. So I um, just want to conclude that this is a conclusion of our presentation and thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to provide the latest stormwater uh, permit status update. And I believe Carrie is here too. So if you have any questions. Thank you. We'll go to members of the public first. Uh, there's one, oh, two people who have their, who have their hand raised. Colin user one is first. Well, I'm glad you guys are doing something about the waste. I mean, it's about time, right? Like you focus on all these other issues and now things are starting to come to a head. We're running out of water, sanitation's bad, and you actually have to do something. It's amazing. I wish that, uh, I wish that you put this much care into the Rose Garden bathroom making sure the Rose Garden fountain works. Hey, 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 Dev, are you listening? And I mean, but I don't have a lot of uh, hope due to how the city runs everything else. Bad roads, bad planning, bad police department, slow response time from the fire department. Now you guys are in, you guys are in charge of the muck. I hope that you can do a better job than what you do with everything else because you guys are failing as a city. And a city that has a lot of money where it, where it all goes, nobody knows. But uh, with all this new money coming down from Uncle Joe and Auntie Kamala, I hope you guys can uh, make sure that uh, we, you know, we're not uh, drinking uh, water with with feces in it. But it sounds like that's what's probably going to happen because that's what always happens when this city is in charge of something. It all goes to S H I T. You know what I mean? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr. Beekman. Hi, Larry Beekman here. Uh, thank you for this item. Waiting for the clock to start here. Okay, great. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Happy new week. Um, it, was, uh, it was nice to hear from uh, Rajani again. And uh, it's nice to know where she's working now. This is the first time I've said her name, Rajani. And uh, so thanks. It was it was nice to hear. Hopefully I've, I've said her name okay. It's, Interesting to try to say her name, Rajani. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to comment. Uh, I think first off, uh, you know, I'm trying to get over the what's happened uh, with our, to ourselves the past few weeks. It's been difficult. Um, I, I, but I hope we can still bring up items. I hope, you know, we, we've gone through a certain amount of mourning and, and from that we can start to bring up items again that uh, we really need to talk about at City Council and sometimes death uh, makes things, it makes it difficult to talk about issues. And uh, we're, we're so polite and want to be nice and not hurt anybody, it becomes difficult to talk. Hopefully we can talk about things because things need to be talked about. And uh, so it's those good efforts, it's that positiveness that uh, actually can, what brings us through at this time. So thanks. Uh, there are um, issues with this about uh, green sustainability and that you'll, you're gonna be building the future of uh, you know, local neighborhoods using uh, stormwater systems. And I think there's a real question about, uh, I mean, real. you're gonna practice green sustainability practices, which is really good and hopeful that I think everybody would is appreciative of, but there are questions that there's a certain gentrification process about it that may actually work to, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it may cause uh, to take away the livelihood of certain businesses. To, to work on these stormwater green sustainability issues. I hope we all know the guardrails and what good practices are and, and trust each other to talk each other, to each other about it. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, my daughter just opened the garage door without 
texting me first. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it looks like we can go back to the, my colleagues. Um, do any of my colleagues have questions? Or Move staff? to accept the report. Second. Thank you. I actually do have a couple of questions. One moment. I'm sorry. Okay, Deb, while you're doing that, do you mind if I ask a question, a quick question? Please go for it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, regarding the, I guess it was, it wasn't numbered, but it was slide C3 regarding new and redevelopment and uh, the 10,000 square feet as it relates to, Jeff, thank you, residential. Is that I heard one reference to the lot size, but when you first said it, I heard that to mean a construction site. So when you're talking 10,000 square foot of a single family, is that a lot size or the dwelling? That's a pretty big house, but is it a lot size that you're talking about? Jeff, do you want to just maybe review the um, the different components of that? It it sort of gets a little bit confusing as we uh, reference many different square feet and water and materials, et cetera. So just yeah. kind of an important one. So thank you for asking. Yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, happy to clarify. It's uh, not actually the lot size. So when we talk about square footage uh, with regards to stormwater, it's tied to the creation or replacement of impervious surface. So we're really focused on the surfaces that the stormwater is gonna run off. So your lot size um, could be much larger, but if you're only replacing um, you know, 2,000 square feet or you're only creating 2,000 square feet, then that wouldn't necessarily trigger that type of requirement uh, with regards to impervious surface. So, the 10,000 square feet is for newly created impervious service or replaced impervious service as part of a redevelopment project. And so, Jeff, is a building, does a building create an impervious service? So, impervious services would include, yeah, absolutely. So, building, the parking lots, any of these hardscapes or the pathways. Okay, but you're saying 10,000 square feet for a residential lot that's if you're talking dwelling and parking that's a big house that's a big house that's single story right i just want to i mean i'm trying yeah. to understand what what properties will um be affected by this additional cost and what and and uh requirement and what won't and it sounds like most of the parcels it, single family in the city of San Jose will not be, will be exempted because of their size. Is that? That's correct. Right? So it, you're right. The roof area is what we're, we're talking about. The surface that the rain is actually going to be falling on. So that would include the driveway or the roof area. And it's going to impact only those very large impervious surface areas. So the large houses, this is a regional permit, so it applies. This requirement applies to cities throughout the Bay Area, um, and so it will impact cities differently. But for San Jose, it likely won't impact. It won't impact the majority of single-family homes. Okay, so just so I can completely understand this in in my little brain, when we're covering the surface with anything other aside from vegetation, grass, that sort of thing. That's what you're talking about. Uh, that's where the square footage uh, is calculated based on, you know, it could be concrete in your driveway or your garage, that's, that sort of thing. Whatever, we're, we're paving paradise, right? So whatever we're paving over or, or uh, encapsulating away from affecting the ability from rainwater or storm or rainwater to sink, to uh, sink into the ground. And I know those are not the technical terms. Those are my terms that I'm that that's where we have to be concerned. And that's how the calculations are done. Is that right? That's okay, correct. good. Thank you. That's Thank it for you. me. 
Thank you for saving me, Council Member Foley. Um, and those were some of my questions too, so it was very helpful. Council Member Cohen. Yeah, I was gonna ask questions on the same topic. Um, so just to be a little bit clearer, if, if somebody were, were paving over their yard to put in a parking area in their front yard, it would have to be more than 10, more than 10,000 square feet to incur the requirement. The requirement is not, is that a fee or is that a mitigation or something they would have to do as part of the work? So if, if someone's paving over their front yard, yeah, you would have to, it's a single family home project, you would have to trigger that, that square footage. They would have to pave it an additional 10,000 square feet uh, of their yard. And the requirement is to prevent the pollution from running off to the street. So it won't mm -hmm. necessarily be a, a, a fee, but it's gonna actually be implementing control measure like a, a rain garden or a bioretention facility to catch the water and then infiltrate it through a soil structure that will treat the water before it infiltrates it through the ground in a native soil or being sent into our storm drain system. So it's essentially a mitigation. Yeah. So there's some treatments, for example, of paving, which are, are using bricks as opposed to, or pavers as opposed to concrete due to the fact that it can drain between the pavers, that would be a mitigation. It could be designed in a way that's not affecting the, or not causing rainwater to run straight off onto the street. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely, yes. There's permeable pavement so that it is no longer impervious. It allows that water to infiltrate as you indicated and that would qualify. Okay. So, but this sounds like it'll mostly affect like large, if you put in a new development and you have a big parking lot or if you put in a building that takes up a lot of square footage, then you'd have to, you know, build in ways of capturing that rain, that runoff in appropriate ways. Yes. Okay. And then, um, uh, oh, the other question you said about replacing too. So if you were, so does that mean when they repave a parking lot or if, or a driveway gets resurfaced? Is that what that means by replacing? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. When we talk about replacing, uh, we're talking mostly about removing the pavement. So it wouldn't necessarily apply to just paving over an existing parking lot. If you were to remove a building and put in a parking lot or build a building on top of a parking lot, you're changing the type of impervious service, you're replacing a parking lot with a roof structure. And it's those sides of projects, those types of impacts that would trigger this requirement. And then you had an estimate of $27 per square foot that you that you think it costs. That's just a basic a calculation you've done about what you think the mitigations would cost a developer, for example, as they do the work. Right, we worked with development services who uh, came up with that cost estimate. And that's what they applied to the green infrastructure, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. And so, I mean, ultimately, the, this is out of our control, right? I mean, this is going to be something that will be imposed on the city. Is the city taking a position? Is the city advocating in one way or another? Or are we just getting, are we just getting a report here as to what's coming down the pike? I think it's, it's a balance of both. So wanting to share with you all kind of what we see um, as um, coming our way. Some of them uh, are more favorable than others. I, we do agree that there needs to be improved efforts to um, improve the water quality. So I think that is definitely shared and we support anything that leads in that direction. Um, some of the changes around the credits we're not supportive of. Um, the bag ban we think our work uh, around homeless encampments have provided positive uh, results in the waterways. And so we are uh, continuing to, as Jeff and Rajni indicated, we're continuing to advocate for those not to be phased out because we find them effective and we find them to have mutual benefits um, for our community. Um, and so wanting to hear from you all, you know, if uh, what you what you kind of how you feel about our position on things and just know that there are going to be additional costs. Um, but as Jeff and Rajni indicated, we do believe most of the extra cost is going to improve water quality. And I would say that we ought to be promoting the use of new kinds of materials and, and construction that provides um, ways for water to drain through our surfaces and not create runoff. So this is an opportunity for us to try to do things better in more environmentally sound ways 
So I, I'm, it, we ought to be now figuring out what, what is it that we're going to promote and ask for when, when people are doing these kinds of developments. And even for our residents who aren't necessarily doing 10,000 square feet, we ought to be encouraging certain kinds of construction in their front yards as they pave over and put in these new parking lots and things so that they're using um, you know, penetrable surfaces that will be better for the environment. Thank you. Those are great ideas. And what we'll do is we'll work with our um, outreach and with PBCE to also ensure that as folks in come into City Hall to, to talk about development, that they're not only seeing what's required, but some env more environmentally favorable options. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we already have um, requirements for at least single family homes, if not other residences, about how much like greenery you have to have in your front yard. You can't just pave over your front yard if you want to. Is that is that correct? I know that's more of a code enforcement question, but I think you might know the answer. Um, well, I, I'm not sure for every part of town how, how the um, land designation applies, but the, um, the city does have requirements. So yes, you're right. The city does have requirements in terms of whether or not you can make your front yard a parking lot um, or, or not. But um, Jeff, let's, uh, let's connect up with PBCE and make sure that we're making that link in our conversations um, so that we're just reinforcing those messages along the way, because um, I'm not certain of those limits. I'm pretty sure you have to have at least one tree in your front yard, unless you're on a corner, we're on a corner, I think the requirement is three trees. Um, if you live on a corner, something like that. And, and there's a certain percentage of your, of your yard that has to be greenery is my understanding. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's changed since I, it was before I got on council that I learned about that when we first became homeowners, but um, I don't, I don't think that that has changed. So I don't think that people can just pave over their front yard if they if they wanted to i don't know how artificial turf um falls into that so that'd be kind of interesting to know but um probably not here the here nor there for this this item i was wondering about um and i appreciate the the questions especially on the ten thousand square feet i was going to ask about that um the question for roadway projects when we're talking about one acre with replacement down to base on the on the C3 slide. How many miles of what does that mean exactly? So we normally say road miles and and when we're calculating acreage, I'm assuming that that's a surface area. So if it's a 30 foot or a 60 foot road, how long is that? And how many miles of of pavement do we think that that like how much do we have in the budget to do that down to base? Jeff, you're our lead mathematician. Can you uh, can you run us through that uh, that stormwater math? Lead mathematician. Oh boy, sorry, they wouldn't have told me that in high school. Um, <laughs> so, really, the way we're looking at this is you're right, surface area. I don't know how that. Um, is looked at uh, linear miles, but we're looking at the roadway width. And then if we're looking at that from a linear mile, I can give it to you in the perspective of a project, for instance, between um, the Pizza Hut in your district where there's a bioretention facility and mm -hmm. the um, school, the elementary school, I think it's Herbert Hoover or that yeah, elementary Hoover. school. That's mm -hmm. essentially one acre of treatment when you look at one okay. half of the roadway. So one half of that roadway. And so if you treated both sides, that would be about two acres. So we're looking at a couple okay. uh, couple streets, basically. In Rick, Rick Scott wants to help you out. Is that okay, Jeff? Oh, please. Thank you, Thanks. Rick. <laughs> Thanks, I was hoping to be on here for another item, but um, I, I can't question Jeff's math. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he's he's got me there. Um, but the one questions. thing that I wanted to clarify is that disturbing the base uh, distinction is incredibly important for our work yeah. because yeah. most of our work does not disturb the base, including most of our resurfacing work. So, you know, I think to your point about the budget, you know, I, I would not say we expect a major impact at this time to the paving work that we're doing based on this permit um, so far from what we've seen. 
So I, I don't know if that was kind of what you were getting at with the yeah. question, but um, that that is kind of our perspective on it, I think. Okay, so will it impact? So it sounds like the resurfacing, we don't disturb the base. When we're talking about the 300 million that we have from Measure T for our worst neighborhood streets, is that where we get into this needing an additional 79 million for roadway maintenance for the um, for the green stormwater? Probably not. Okay. Um, I, I will say that that of the 300 million that we spend on resurfacing, most of that work does not. The vast majority does not disturb the base. Um, so I think I think the 79 million estimate is based on a hypothetical in which we would be disturbing the base and kind of getting down there. Um, that's not most of the work that we do. Uh, for, for pavement maintenance within the city. So I, I would imagine the impact, at least on that particular type of infrastructure, would be less than, than what is presented here. Okay, and does it have to be proximate? So if we were, I guess I'm thinking of the areas that are, at least in Willow Glen, that are, they have to go down farther when they have to redo the street where they're not just resurfacing, but they're actually repaving. Does that disturb the base? And then do, does the stormwater project have to be there or or could it should it be in a place that has greater need for other issues like urban heat you know urban heat effect i don't think i can answer the second part of your question i mean i imagine yeah. there's a mitigation you know that could be in place but again i i can't answer that piece but i can i can definitely confirm that even in kind of the worst streets in Willow Glen, we rarely disturb the base. I, okay. I, I could provide a list just for like an idea of how, how rare it is, but it is not typical at all for the kind of uh, paving work that we do. Maybe like a new street would be an example where you're creating a whole new street that might, you know, there might not be a street there at all. Okay. Um, but, but just kind of grinding off those top layers and putting on a, a new layer of asphalt, which is what most of the Measure T work is, um, would not comprise disturbing the base. Okay, then I guess I'm wondering where that $70 million, $79 million estimate came from. So and how much it has to be in reality. Can you talk about, um, about how the cross departmental team came up with 79 million as a, as a estimate? Yeah, absolutely. So we worked with the pavement maintenance program to define uh, what potential projects could be impacted by the current uh, language being proposed in the administrative draft, which at that point, was just disturbed down the base. So uh, when we looked at that, we didn't know for sure what that was going to encompass. So DOT focused on the lowest scoring PCI scores. And then as, to, and then as Rick indicated, kind of took that hypothetical worst case scenario and said, okay, if we need to disturb down the base as we do, as is done in some cases, as I understand, for those lower scored PCI, then that would potentially trigger uh, that amount of cost. Okay, so over what number of years is that $79 million estimate? And so we uh, looked at the three-year pavement maintenance program, and so that would be estimated over that time frame. And I should also clarify that the cost estimate was not developed by DOT. That's actually a regional estimate uh, that was done for the, for the Bay Area modeling. And so that's where we tie the dollar number to the um, amount of streets. So Jeff, safe to say with um, Rick's much more optimistic view than uh, some of the pavement maintenance folks, and then um, also sort of acknowledging the, the regionality of some of the estimates, sounds like 79's worst case, and it will be significantly less than yeah, it, it, it would be safe to say that that's a worst case scenario and it, it could potentially be significantly unlikely, much less. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful to know and then um, makes me wonder if the $27 per square foot for development is also a worst case scenario. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I did want to comment on the um, proposed removal of the credits. I think that especially the creek cleanups, I don't even understand why they're wanting to remove those credits. Um, it, it's work that we find very necessary and I don't know that we would find it less necessary um, and to not get credit for it. I, I just, honestly, I don't even understand why 
Um, the only thing I could think of, and 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 please let me know when they're talking about these new requirements for unhoused. Are they talking about um, the actions taken to address homelessness and the interdepartmental coordination potentially giving credits for that work, and that they saw that as sort of a replacement of the credits for the creek cleanups? I guess I'm. It, it wasn't clear. My, yeah, my so we um, we've done quite a bit of engagement with. Um, with the water board on this topic and we've spoken at a number of their uh, of their hearings on the matter because we feel very strongly that particularly now we ought to um, approach these efforts with things that provide the most benefit to the community and right now helping the homeless provides benefits to the creek and that same dollar provides benefit to our um, our unhoused population and um, and unfortunately they didn't agree with us in that perspective um, my sense is that their perspective is um, the waterways are not looking good. So the current approach is not working. So, um, so while the creek cleanups are beneficial, they're not resulting in cleaner water. And so I think that's really where they're saying we need to do something different. Um, we're not averse to doing something different, but, um, but I just really think we need to... Um, we need to again provide that dual benefit, and um, so we'll continue to advocate for that. Um, but um, but we don't. We do think it's going to change. That that the credits will be removed for that. That the credits will be removed, and that they'll we're seeing enhanced um, efforts to um, ensure that homeless are not along the waterways and are not um, not um, illegally discharging into the waterways. And so we need to step up our efforts in that regard. Do our Beautify SJ trash and hygiene services potentially um, cover some of what they're talking about? They do not. So, so those services, um, while they're helpful to the unhoused community, they do not result in material not being discharged. Waterways. So when, when people are living along the waterways, um, they're washing their dishes in the creeks, they're um, bathing in the creeks, and, and unfortunately at times they're also ingesting the water in the creeks, which is not the healthiest water for, um, for people to be doing any of those activities in. But the um, trash collection and hygiene services are, um, are not adequate to protect our waterways. Okay. Um, thank you. But they certainly were helpful during COVID. Certainly. Um, so you had talked a little bit about this being a regional permit and the, and the process, Rajani, about, um, the draft and the, and the permit being extended. Does that, if it's a regional permit, are we in working in coordination with other municipalities on mm -hmm. our, on our comments and our lack of a better term lobbying for the terms of this permit? Yeah, we, we work uh, throughout um, various um, agencies or other entities within the Santa Clara County. So um, it's an acronym, SCVRP. I'm not sure if the, the community uh, the committee is familiar with them. So I don't know that one. Uh, yeah, uh, there's many acronym, acronyms I've been learning in this uh, in this field. So um, it, uh, Jeff, break it down for me. It's Santa Clara Valley Urban Runoff Prevention Pollution, Pollution Prevention Program. Yes. yes. So, um, and, and we're working in tandem with uh, cities like from Palo Alto to Milpitas um, and then Monsterino down south. So it, it it's quite a few, but uh, particularly what Carrie's talking about, what's unique for us in San Jose is a lot of the activities that do occur in our waterways, which is not common in other cities. So that's why we really push hard and advocate for a, you know, the direct discharge program to be um, honored specifically for our city. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for my questions. I appreciate you taking the time to, um, to answer all those. I was just trying to understand exactly what's, what's gonna happen with us and what the, what the potential impact to the budget is. I'm glad it's not 79 million, um, that that's a worst case scenario. But given the last year, I never discount the worst case scenario anymore. Um, I think we are ready for the vote. Holly? Aye. 
Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That motion carries and we will move on to item D2, Regional Transportation Activities Quarterly Report. Ramses, do you want to start us off? I also see Jessica. This one's uh, Jess and Zahir. I'm the next yeah, one. actually, Council Member John Russo, Director of Transportation. John, there you are. Yeah, we've got the next three items. Thank you. Gotcha. And uh, first up is actually the transportation activities, which is really more about projects that are going on. Uh, Jessica Zenk, Deputy Director, and Zaire Gulzad, our Division Manager, are going to take the presentation. So we've got a lot of information, so I will get out of the way and let them proceed. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, uh, City Council Members and Chair Davis. Uh, please, next slide, here. All right, this is our quarterly update on the regional activities that are underway in the transportation space. Uh, in your memorandum on this item, you have a full listing of the projects that we partner with, whether those are highway projects, rail projects, transit projects with BTA, Caltrain, high-speed rail, uh, the BART project. And today we are gonna focus on our highway projects that we partner with VTA and Caltrain on, Caltrain's on. Um, Zahir is gonna start with a general update on the regional highway projects uh, that are our priorities under VTA's measure B, but we're gonna focus on the two highway projects that are beginning the, uh, the construction phase in one case and under construction in the other. So next slide. The goals of our regional highway program are to modernize our major infrastructure. Many of these uh, interchanges or systems were constructed you know, three, four, five, six decades ago. And that shows in how people use them or want to use them very differently. One of the things that we note is a lack of safe and direct connections between parts of San Jose that have been divided by the freeways that came in in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. We're looking in particular to connect the trails and the major places that people want to go on foot and on bike, where it's often very, very difficult to access across those freeway barriers without a, without a car. And we're also always utilizing our complete streets design standards and guidelines and looking for the most high quality separation from cars um, for people who are biking or walking whenever that's feasible. And you'll see that in the two projects that are under construction uh, soon or underway right now. With this, I'm gonna turn it over to Zahir who's gonna finish the presentation and then we will all be available for questions. Zahir. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Great. Yes, Thank we can you. Hear you. Good afternoon, Chair, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Zahir Gozada, managing the Regional and Local Project Grant Delivery Division. Today, I'm going to provide you a very brief update on our regional program, and then we'll focus on two projects that the US 101 Blossom Hill Interchange Project currently in construction and the US 101 Trimble de la Cruz interchange project, which is completed final design. On the other regional projects, more detailed information can be found in the regional section of the TNE report. The US 101 Mayberry Road, pro in road Interchange Project and the Zanker uh, 101 Overcrossing Project, as well as the Charcot Avenue Extension Project and the 280 Winchester Boulevard interchange projects are all in various stages of project development and, are, and some will be moving into final EIR and others will be starting final design of the project. All these projects are listed as part of the Measure B highway program and will provide funding for the construction phase of the project. Again, additional detailed information can be found in the regional highway section of the report. I can change my screen. Focusing on the US 101 Blossom Hill Interchange Improvement Project, I'm so excited to let you know that this project is in construction and is 
the first San Jose project funded by Measure B highway program to go into construction. The design of this interchange project is not the typical vehicle centric focus interchange, but is designed in a way to provide safe access for bed bikes at the same time addressing the congestion and operational needs of the area. The scope includes the construction of a bridge structure over 101 between two existing Blossom Hill Road bridge decks to accommodate the addition of one vehicle lane in each direction, including the median island as depicted in the yellowish tan color running along the center. The unique feature of this, of this project is the installation of the class one separated bicycle pedestrian structure. Starting on the right side of the slide, the enhanced class one bike pet facility as depicted in green starts at Coyote Creek Trail on the east side of 101. From there, the pathway climbs along Blossom Hill crossing over the northbound on-ramps and joining along Blossom Hill Road bridge structure. But once on the west side of 101, the class one facility starts to descend back to uh, and goes through two undercrossing. And the first undercrossing is under south, uh, the southbound loop on ramp, and the second one is the southbound um, off ramp, as depicted in the white box. The design of the two bike pad undercrossing structure was chosen to maximize the natural light by providing openings between the two structures, creating a safe and comfortable facility for all users. From there, once the crossing is completed over all the freeway facilities, the enhanced bike pad facility will continue down to Monterey Road with a new sidewalk connecting Xander's Zan Crossing on the west side of 101, as shown on the right side of the slide. So what's, so what's happening as part of the construction, you ask? Well, I'm happy to report that the construction has been very going very well. I want to bring your attention back to the undercrossing depicted in the, in, in the white box in the previous slide. We have completed one of the two undercrossing structures there. These images, excuse me, these images show the construction of a pedestrian bicycle undercrossing structure that goes under southbound 101 off ramp. A similar undercrossing structure will also be built underneath the southbound loop on ramp. We are also in the process of completing the new bridge structure over 101 between the two existing Blossom Hill Road bridge decks to accommodate the additional lane and median. The image, the, the excuse me, the image on the, on the left shows the rebar prep work for the bridge deck. The carpet of steel gives the strength and flexibility to these bridge structures and are designed to carry thousands of vehicles per day with withstanding the shakes of California severe earthquakes. The image on the right shows the, the concrete bridge deck mostly poured and being sprayed with water to cool as it, as it cures. An interesting fact, no, we did not forget to pour the segment that you see to the left. This is where the new bridge deck meets the old or existing bridge prior to completion completing this final part of the concrete pour, there is a waiting period for, to monitor the deflection or movement of structures as the concrete pour is cured, as, as, is, as it is poured and cured. Once there are no movements detected for a certain amount of time, the completion of the deck closure will be done. The waiting period for, for that has since completed for, the, for this particular test and the completion of the pour is estimated to occur in about two weeks. Lastly, I wanted to share the construction of the soil nail wall location between westbound and northbound 101 on-ramps. The picture on the left shows an early stage of the wall construction. The basic method consists of a large nails that are driven into the soil and anchored with grout and and then connected to the steel net that you see there. This will become part of the wall holding back the soil as shown in the picture to the left. The, work, uh, the workers are installing false work for the next phase, which is the steel reinforced concrete wall pour. 
you see that phase partially completed in the picture to the right. The wall features architectural treatments with an oak leaf motif that the community helped select representing the nearby community Coyote Creek area. The project is proceeding as scheduled with expected completion by early 2023. Total project cost is estimated at 42 million in construction. The final project that I want to focus on is the U.S. Trimble Dela Cruz uh, Interchange Project, which proposes to reconstruct the 101 Trimble Roadway Dela Cruz Interchange and replace the bridge over 101 with a wider structure to improve traffic operation. I'm happy to report that the Trimble Project's completed design and received the necessary encroachment permit from Caltrans to construct the project. This person project is administered by VTA with oversight from the city. VTA advertised the project in his open bid just last Wednesday. The project will be awarded to the lowest bidder pending them meeting all the bidding requirements. One thing to highlight here is that we applied and received a 25 million SB1 funding grant. Given this is also a Measure B funded project, this is potential savings of 25 million to measure B highway program. As with the 101 Blossom Hill Interchange project, the US, the US 101 Trimble project also uses unique design features to provide enhanced bike path facilities across an otherwise busy vehicle centric interchange. Some of these features are pictured here, such as the open air undercrossing, the artwork on the side of the walls, and the unique spiral design path for Ped and bike facilities uh, for both ped and bike to avoid major at grade um, crossings. And within the spiral, if you can see that, uh, it's about right here, there is a staircase for able bodies uh, to take a shortcut if they do not want to use the spiral. As shown in the green, the bike ped facility will start at the Guadalupe River Trail on the east side of 101 represented here on the right side of the picture. The enhanced bike facility will cross Dela Cruz Boulevard and at the and at the short and the short crossing at the northbound on-ramp. Then the path will climb with Trimble Road profile, graveling along the Trimble Bridge deck. To avoid the major on and off ramps at the grade crossing, both the staircase, for both a staircase for a able bodies and ADA compliance spiral ramp as mentioned and pictured in the previous slide, will be built. The staircase and spiral will both lead to undercrossings um, structures to avoid the southbound on and off ramp. As with Blossom Hill project, these undercrossing structures are designed to allow lots of natural light and comfort to provide comfort and safety for users. From the undercrossing structure, the path will continue and connect with existing bike path facilities. The project is expected to be completed by late 2023 with funding coming from Measure B and SB1 grant. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. I will uh, turn it back for, to Jessica and open it up for questions. Jess, did you have something you wanted to add? No, just we are here for, for any of your questions and, and the public. Okay, we'll go to members of the public now. Uh, Roland is first. I'm Robin, not Roland, but okay. Um, good afternoon. I would like to briefly comment on the charcoal update in the staff memo. I appreciate that staff is looking into alternatives to the project, but let me note a few things. If I counted correctly, there are now 13 or even 14 different projects alternatives that have been discussed in various documents over the last few years. But there's a common thread to all these alternatives. Staff has proposed a number of alternatives that would lead to thousands of additional cars next to Orchard Elementary School. The community has proposed a number of alternatives that would not do that. So let me emphasize, over the years, staff has come up with eight different ways of putting thousands of additional cars into a school zone. I've bit my tongue a lot over the last three years, so allow me a moment to be frank. Putting thousands of cars next to a school is ridiculous. It doesn't matter if you go in front of the school or around the back. It's wrong either way. It doesn't matter if the school is in North San Jose, downtown, Willow Glen, or anywhere else. 
we all agree we need to try to get cars out of school zones instead of causing more traffic. And let's be clear, we're not talking about an apartment building adding a couple of hundred trips a day. We're talking about 10 to 20,000 cars each day. Putting more cars next to a school is and will remain ridiculous. It is wrong and it will continue to be met with vigorous opposition from the community. We've been very patient with staff, letting them work through their eight different alternatives, all of which are offensive to the community. But it is time for staff to recognize that their alternatives are not working and not wanted. Instead of fighting each other, which is just a waste of time and money, and I would like to remind the committee that staff has spent over a million dollars in consultant fees alone on this project. Instead, let's work together to focus on those alternatives that don't put children in harm's way. There isn't a point in dragging this on for another three years or longer. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Roland. Roland, can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I was unmuted, somebody muted me again anyway. Um, so thank you ever so much uh, for bringing um, the US 101 Bluffton Mill interchange uh, back to council for um, further discussion and uh, I believe enlightenment to people not familiar with uh, that part of San Jose. Um, but rather than me, you know, rambling on, I'm wondering if it would be possible to go back to either slide five or slide number nine and uh, through the chair, um, if staff um, could help members of the community who live down there understand how they are supposed to be negotiating the connectivity or lack thereof between the Blossom Hill uh, Caltrain Station and Coyote Creek, especially specifically if you look at the bottom of the slide, you see right, at, uh, right below the loop, uh, there is a, a road on the opposite side of, um, of 101, which is known as Ford Road, which is the the connection to the Caltrain station. That's where that's where the Monterey Highway overpass is that takes people into the station. And how we get to the junction between Ford Road and Monterey Highway, and whatever it is that staff are building down there. Um, it's a mystery to us, and, and any uh, enlightenment would be most appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, this is Blair Beekman. Uh, once again, I'm sitting on the floor to speak this time. I've been sitting on my floor recently and speaking public comment time. Uh, to also note, uh, I think it's uh, Rajani. Maybe that's how to say her name. I'll learn how to say her name eventually. And uh, but it's 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 a nice name to say. It's it seems that it can have many variations. So I'll get it right sometime. Uh, for this item, this item is very similar to the next item. Uh, I wanted to mention that we talk on this item. I'll mention the bicycle things uh, and housing actually on the next item. For this issue, uh, to concentrate on kind of more regional things. Uh, there's the East Ridge Transit Corridor, uh, light rail things, uh, Caltrain, uh, CHSR. Uh, you know, I hope we can make an effort to really respect uh, what the East, rail, uh, East Ridge light rail project can be. I think it's really, we kind of hit kind of a, just a dull point with the project. And I'm interested how we can kind of kind of give it a little bit of life and happiness at this time, what we can do to do that. Because it seems like a good guy, a good project. And uh, to work that out, it's been a long time in the making. So hopefully we can figure something out with that. Um, with the CHSR project, uh, to be perfectly, perfectly honest, I think it's time we really have to respect that. Uh, it's very possible you know, in, in the coming years that the first CHSR is going to be coming through using the ACE uh, light rail system or ACE rail system. And we have to get used to that fact. And they're going to build it, uh, you know, through the Central Valley first and use the ACE rail system. And then 10 to 15 years later, when San Jose finally develops its political will 
then possibly you can come into San Jose, but we have to learn how to be open about that subject matter. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I believe it's pronounced Rajani. Next speaker is Colin user one. Yeah, this is the same city council that wants to you know have road diets everywhere. They're giving a road diet on Blossom Hill Road down to like one lane to get into this thing. They're already starting them on Hillsdale, everybody. Wait for all the traffic and everything you're going to see soon. Now, you guys need to maintain the roads that we have and uh, trying to reconfigure 101 Blossom Hill. That should have happened a long time ago. You guys messed around with it before. Now you're going to mess around again. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be traffic. And, you know, once again, there's going to be more road diets. Can you guys maintain the trash like you don't on Highway 280 and 87 and all that uh, uh, mess? It's over. It looks like a garbage dump. I wonder if this is going to be the same thing. But we'll see. We'll see if this mass transit uh, fantasy ever happens. It won't. I mean, uh, those poor people who were killed the other day, I mean, they haven't even been able to reopen uh, light rail or there's not enough buses to cover and uh, it was very terrible what happened there but imagine that those they can't even get things up and running because they can't find anyone to replace those uh, poor people who were murdered to, to do the work so how are you going to have even more and more uh, light rail or buses when there's not enough we had to have San Francisco bring their muni buses God help us to uh, cover for the the transit deficiency that we had due to what happened, and uh, this city and county is just they're just incapable. It's it's a it, like I've always said it's it's a it's a uh, it's a student union in a sophomore uh, uh, college sophomore in college type term paper that's a, a fantasy. It's a lot of it is Marxist inspired, and just like anything that's Marxist, it looks good on paper and. Uh, in 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 reality, it'll be terrible. Look what's happening to the people over there with the, with the flea market. Really. Thank you. Turning now to the committee, Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, thanks for the update. A lot of uh, a lot of good work going on, and I know a lot of it's focused in District Four. So I have a number of questions, and I know we saw the first project, which I'm excited is getting started this year at De La Cruz in 101, and that'll help in that area. Um, but we didn't we didn't talk much about the two other very important projects, uh, the 101 Mabry and and the uh, um, and the Zanker overcrossing. So I'm just going to ask a couple questions about those before I get onto my favorite topic. Um, so so I at, I know that the timelines in these projects don't aren't, aren't strictly you know city, especially the 101 Mabry project, right? I mean that's that's being run by Caltrans at this point. Is is that is are they the limiting factor and figuring out timelines? Because it looks like the, the update here has a pretty late late date for design and starting construction. Council member, uh, John Russell, Director of Transportation. And in all of these projects that are associated with the state freeway system involves Caltrans in some way, they actually have to review and approve everything that will be placed in the right away for construction. But getting to the, to the you mentioned, um, both of those projects are, are going through a phase of development environmental and actually on the uh, maybe a very plan we're doing some additional alternatives analysis to determine which inter intersection or interchange location would be best to serve both the motorists and the new developments over at the Berryessa flea market so we're looking at both of those both at a Berryessa heading and at the existing neighbor to see which one makes the most sense for an interchange. So, and then back onto one of them's anchor, that, that project's in environmental phase right now. So that's why some of the, these are pretty complicated, complex projects that will involve some right of way, which will be needed for the project. So some of those timeframes seem long, but that's what it takes to actually develop and put in place these pretty complex projects. So did that answer your question? Over yeah, your it does. I mean, that, and I think I, I mean, I probably am broken record asking these questions, but I always forget the details. Um, at uh, for that Maybury project, it looks like from the timeline here that we're probably talking about the soonest of like 2020, 28 before a project would be 
uh, before anything would be complete? Uh, probably, because we're, we are going through a process right now that to, to figure out which one is the best location. And then we're gonna bring that decision to council to see which one we want to proceed with in terms of the more detailed analysis. So that's gonna come and Zaire maybe remind me when we think we're gonna be able to bring that decision to council, probably within next year, is that likely? So yeah, so then following that, it would be full environmental clearance, design it, um, acquire the right of way and then build it, which again, it's a complex of interchanges. So whatever we do, if we decide Berryessa heading, then we've got to redo Mayberry, we've got to redo Old Vulcan Road. So whatever's gonna happen out there is probably gonna affect all three of those roadway intersections with wildlife. And we have to try to do it in a way that doesn't make things even worse in an area that's already pretty bad. Yeah, right now that the, both the freeway traffic is pretty bad with a congestion point right at 880 and 101. And um, we expect the, uh, you know, the roadways will probably become more busy as the areas of flea market areas start to build up. Yeah, my concern is that, that, that this will be like eight years of the BART station being open without that improvement. And obviously, I know that that's just the way the timing has worked, but um, the people are going to people are going to start being pretty frustrated in that area once traffic on BART station becomes more normal, and uh, and traffic patterns haven't been adjusted in the area getting in and out from 101 and 880. So, right. I, you know, I, <laughs> obviously anything we can do to to speed it along would be good, but I know it's it's pretty complicated. Yep. Um, as far as Anchor 101, um, is, is there some kind of estimate as to how much that project's going to end up costing? That I need some help with. I think there was an earlier estimate that we're refining now. Um, so I, I don't have that particular number it's, right now, but maybe Zaire knows that number. It's about $140 million at this point, but we're refining that estimate. And most of that, of course, because the project is in the location where the land value and the right of value is so expensive that that's where that cost is. So a lot of it is land cost in addition to construction cost. Uh, correct. Yeah, there's a pretty large uh, swapping and switching of properties for freeway, and then trying to trying to open that up for for that. So, um, it, another complicated project that's trying to trying to do multiple things all at once. So. But it'll really bring bring traffic flow, improve traffic flow in and out of North San Jose, and uh, and, and actually this one's timed well because as we begin doing the developments along Zanker and First Street in that area the road could be in construction around the same time as opposed to the situation near the BART station where, you know, uh, well, at least the BART station's open, although I guess you're, we're also thinking about the long-term various urban village development, which hasn't yeah. been built yet. So yes, this would this provides a new connection. And those are really important into an area that's really dearth of connections that, that uh, span these man-made barriers like 101 or 880. So they're really helping, they will help once we get these connected, constructed, and actually open for use. So yeah, this is gonna be a really big uh, big help for the area. Okay, so then I'm just gonna move on to the, the other item on here, just the Charcot project. I mean, we've had extensive discussions between myself, my office, uh, DOT about this project, but since it's been brought up now in public comment, I'll. I'll Take the opportunity to say make some public comments about the project as well, since I haven't done that yet. Um, you know, I, I'm committed to not having it built in the current alignment on Silkwood, um, as you know. Um, I don't think the community is any more favorable about the the east feeding Fox Lane alternative. There may be another alternative at Fox Lane that could be better. Um, but you know, I was interesting interested to look at at this in juxtaposition to the Blossom Hill project. The Blossom Hill project is going to cost forty two million dollars to do a, a pretty good, you know, to, to provide bike access, safe separated bike lane and, and, and pedestrian lane and uh, improve the median, improve widening the street, improve the interchange. And the, and the Charcot project is penciled out at $50 million for something that has, uh, in my mind, questionable enhancements to transportation, except for the bike lane element. So. I was kind of surprised to see that we're spending more on Charcot than we're spending for that major interchange at Blossom Hill. So just making that comment, I'm I, not necessarily asking a question there. Um, given the local community opposition to the project, that's just another data point for me. Um, 
And I, I think that there are other, other places we could be spending that $50 million, which would have a greater impact and also have less impact on, um, on a school and a community that's, that's gonna fight this no matter where the alignment goes. So I just wanted to make that clear to this committee that this is, this is what I'll continue to focus on in that, for that project going forward. Um, and I think that's it for my questions and comments. Thank you. Do any other members of the committee have any comments or questions? And with that, I'll move also move acceptance of the report. Second. Thank you. Um, just two things. I wanted to follow up on Roland's question about the um, Caltrain connectivity on the Blossom Hill project. So here, do you have any details on that? Yeah, I, I actually do have uh, some details on that. Uh, so in 2016, the the bicycle, the BPAC, uh, the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, as well as uh, the uh, Neighborhood Association, the specifically the Coyote Creek Neighborhood Association, um, uh, supported um, this alternative, the, the the current alternative that we are building, and we did um, extensive outreach with the community. But this, what this alternative does is it actually uh, directs, uh, con it directly connects to Xander's uh, uh, Crossing in the Coyote Creek Trail. And it's, with the, it's consistent with the Edenville area development policy and is, visi uh, and the, and is uh, visible and accessible from Blossom Hill Road versus where it, it Ford Road is, it's kind of in the back of that neighborhood. In addition, there was gonna be significant um, a right away cost, uh, uh, displacement of homes. If we would have went with that alternative, because there's not enough right away uh, to build that uh, POC along Ford Road, um, and uh, just that cost implication was uh, was uh, very significant. And then it was uh, inconsistent with the Edenville uh, development policy as well. Um, so that that is the reason why we went with this alternative. Uh, uh, this uh, discussion point of Port Road has been uh, with us from the beginning, and we explored it uh, very extensively from the, the beginning of the project as we were studying alternatives. And, and we were very careful in choosing the routes that we, the route that we have based on kind of what the policy said, where the funding was coming from, and where the direct connections would be going. Okay, and I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the area quite yet. Um, is there connectivity to the Caltrain station even even though it doesn't have it didn't go with the Ford Road alignment? Yeah. So the nice thing about this alignment is it it provides alignment to both the Edenville neighborhood uh, area uh, through the Xander's Crossing, but uh, more specifically, if you keep on walking past Xander's Crossing, there's a uh, there is a signalized crossing where you can cross over to the Caltrain station at Ford Road. So a direct connection. And then from there, it actually connects again with another POC to the Edenville neighborhood as well. So that so there's multiple connection that this uh, alternative uh, provides. Okay, great, glad to hear it. Um, I did want to give an update. I know your report came in before the Caltrain meeting last Thursday, and so the just for for members of the public and for my committee, um, the Caltrain electrification project dates that are in the report are are a little bit out of date because we had a risk refresh report you may have read in the in the newspaper and the caltrain electrification service will be um, actually is is now slated to probably happen closer to late 2024 as opposed to 2022 um, it's mainly due to a contractor issue with uh, the signal system so we have a lot of at grade crossings uh, for the Caltrain corridor and we have to have a new signal system because the trains are going faster than the pre the current diesel trains and so replacing that signal system has been an issue with the contractor which is causing most of the delays there are all are also some COVID related delays with some suppliers to the um, the in inside of the train sets the new train sets um, a couple of bankruptcies actually and so we've had to get our, our contractor has had to get new suppliers and in some case has taken over the supply of luggage racks and things like that. So we've got delays on both the, the corridor side as well as the train set side. I just wanna give that update, not a happy update, but that's where we are. Um, 
I think we're ready for the vote unless anyone else has any other comments or updates that they wanted to give. I did not send the email reminder to my colleagues about their regional activities and if they wanted to send a report. So totally understand if you don't have anything. All right, crickets, we're ready for the vote. Foley? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, that motion passes and we will move to item D3, local and regional transportation planning and project update. Is this one Ramses? John, do you wanna yep. get uh, to the right person? Uh, Thank uh, you. This is Ramses Kmadu, division manager and Wilson Tamar, transportation planning manager. And these are the planning reports that we're working on right now. Go ahead, Ramses. Great, thanks, John. Um, afternoon, chair and council members. I'm really excited to bring you um, a presentation on our planning activities. Um, you know, we kind of did it backwards in a way, right? Those projects are already in the ground and, and we talk about all the projects that are gonna come next down the, down the big pipeline here. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Now we do have our memo out to you, um, which covers a great deal more than our presentation will. We're happy to take any questions that have come out of the memo um, at the end here, but we're gonna focus on two projects. Sorry, I didn't hit share screen. There we go. And now get this one. And there we go, come on. All right, there we go. Um, so yeah, um, so again, Ramses Madhu, Division Manager, Planning Policy and Sustainability for DOT. I'll be joined by Wilson Tam, our Transportation Planning Manager for this report. Um, we're gonna talk about the Access and Mobility Plan um, as well as the Barry Elsa Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan. Um, that'll be following up the urban village um, that you uh, will hopefully get all, I'll get to vote on uh, uh, shortly at full council. All right, so the access mobility plan, we've been talking about this one for a while um, and uh, we're making some really great progress. We're really excited to share with you uh, what's happening. Um, of course, this plan is the, uh, the place where we as a city are getting to think about what it really means to take on these very big um, uh, climate goals um, and, and take real action towards uh, um, addressing uh, what is the largest contributor um, to uh, the climate change in San Jose, right? Um, uh, 50 to 60 to percent, uh, depending on which report you look at, of uh, emissions come from uh, transportation um, and transportation obviously affects a lot of other big things. Um, so we kind of boil it down to this in terms of what's the magnitude of change that we're really talking about to try to make this work? Well, today about 24% of trips are taken by uh, people biking, people walking, or people taking transit as well as carpool. Um, and in our general plan, we've adopted a goal of getting to 60%. Now uh, that's already a huge goal, um, but the uh, climate smart plan uh, doubles down on that and actually increases that number uh, significantly. And we're still kind of working out in intermittent steps um, to get uh, to there, um, but, it's a pretty big magnitude change. And so we're really trying to think through how to do that. And of course, we're doing that with the community um, uh, through a lot of different avenues. Um, we have as paid partners in our project team uh, for uh, community-based organizations, Luna, PAC, Vivo, um, and the Silicon Valley uh, Independent Living Center um, are all part. Um, and then we're um, uh, trying to foster uh, conversations between different communities that usually don't talk much, uh, like having Luna Impact and, and, and Silicon Valley Living Center together to help us think through the problems. Um, we're doing a lot of meetings um, in multiple languages, Vietnamese, Spanish, English, um, uh, and, and all that. Um, I won't read all of these, um, but I will say we are in the midst of a 50 meeting round um, where by the end of this week, we'll be one tenth of the way through. Um, um, but we're really getting out there with the public right now um, and getting these goals out there, getting the types of projects um, that you'll be seeing here in a second out there um, and getting people's feedback as well as just getting people knowledgeable about what we're doing, mostly with community groups, but um, uh, neighborhood groups, but uh, have a couple big uh, bigger items um, coming up. And thanks again to all the council offices for the uh, great help um, in getting those all together. Um, it's a lot of work on all sides and it's much appreciated from staff um, to get as much support as we're getting. Um, so what have we learned so far from the workshops and community meetings we've had? Well, when we bring these problems to folks and uh, ask them, 
Okay, how, how should we be getting around in the future? We're hearing a lot of, well, we, we want to take public transit and we want a bike, but the system is not there yet to support us in doing that. Um, and so we say, okay, what, what do we need to be able to do that, right? Um, public transit, and a lot of this, of course, is, is focused towards VTA, um, but the city does have a decent amount of, of impact on these things, right? So we're saying, you know, we need better routes, we need faster, uh, more frequent and reliable service, affordability is an issue, um, and then benches, shelters, and better lighting at stops. But I'll also add um, that the city as the, uh, as the entity that controls the design of the roads um, has an immense amount of impact on all of these things. Um, and so we're gonna be talking about the transit first policy here in a second, which we believe is uh, one of the ways that we can help play our part as the city um, in trying to make public transit better. Um, and the other one of course is bikes. Um, folks have expressed a great deal of support for more biking. Um, so, you know, for 55% of the community say they are highly likely to bike more if, um, if they felt more comfortable. Um, and so we're seeing there, you know, the desire for more protective bike lanes, uh, better bike network connectivity and all of that. I don't need to read it all. You guys can read. Um, but um, yeah, I think one thing I do want to highlight those and the other concerns. Um, we're still, we are seeing, um, uh, you know, that the continued desire to see our Vision Zero program really uh, be at the base of a lot of, of mode change, right? If we're going to get people to, to take transit, get people to bike more and walk more, we need to address safety concerns. This is one of the most uh, uh, commonly cited um, reasons that people uh, just aren't changing their mode yet. So what are we doing about this? Um, well, we worked uh, together. Uh, or we brought together um, all of our sister and brother cities out there across the country, Minneapolis, Austin, Seattle, Denver, Portland, um, all of the cities had have some kind of similarity to us and looked at their recent transportation plans and pulled all of the different ideas uh, from their plans, went to the public and asked for ideas, had a lot of internal and, and regional workshops with transportation professionals and got a very large list of potential strategies together, um, kind of fell out to about 250 or so different ideas. Um, and we've been working to kind of uh, rationalize that list. Um, and here are the uh, nine groupings um, that we've put the, the various strategies into. Um, and we'll be uh, kind of working, uh, we're working through those in terms of, of which ones meet our goals, which ones are most plausible um, in terms of, of um, uh, 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 that we can actually do it. Words not coming to me, but that's all right. There we go. So here's a couple highlights of the ones that are really standing out um, and to give you all a uh, sense of what we're, we're working with and kind of pushing towards. Um, of course, they're safer streets. Um, we're already working on these kinds of projects a, a decent amount across the city. Um, where we're taking uh, uh, places um, that are really car focused um, and um, put uh, uh, pretty much make any the environment around the um, uh, road uh, quite uh, unpleasant for anybody except in a car um, and working to reduce those streets, narrow roads where it makes sense to do so, uh, white, making wider sidewalks, making much shorter crossings. This is a great example where you, you get the, you actually get the um, uh, added uh, space for residents as well as this great crossing um, allowing uh, uh, folks to, to feel much more comfortable in this. Um, of course, another one uh, is, is low stress bike facilities, right? Um, we're moving as much as we can towards protected bikeways um, that give physical separation between bikes and um, as cars, as uh, Jessica and Zahir brought up earlier, um, this is uh, getting through all of our project types. We're doing it as much as we can through the pavement program, as much as we can through the regional projects. Um, this is a long-term project, right? Building out a network um, that feels safe for people in a city the size of ours is gonna take many years um, and a lot of effort um, and kind of finding its way into all of those different uh, project types. Um, and here we have the improving existing transit service. Um, so starting off here is the transit first policy. Um, transit first policy uh, was added to uh, council priority list uh, just before COVID. Um, I believe it was um, uh, Pam Foley's office um, who put this in. Um, and so we've been trying to find different avenues to, to get this policy forward. Um, and our intention is now to bring to a full 
transit first policy to council with the actual plan, um, the active mobility plan. Uh, we're kicking off uh, workshops uh, the, over the summer with VTA. Um, once that they feel comfortable kind of back on their feet, um, we'll be working through what VTA wants with that um, and looking at um, everything from street design, uh, signal operations, um, uh, complete street design guidelines, all the different things that we as a city can do um, to ensure um, that we are supporting transit and, and making sure that people in buses um, are getting around as quickly as they can. Um, and that of course includes transit first street design um, and that, and then we're, of course, everything we learn, we're sharing with VTA. We have a VTA staff member who's actually on our project team now, um, making sure that all the input um, that comes in here about, hey, we need, want new routes and new bus, uh, uh, um, new bus facilities, um, that that's getting over to VTA as well trying to really create that, that uh, uh, um, interagency mind meld so we can bring forth better projects together. Um, and then other things we're working on are uh, car wise. Um, so I'm gonna jump, there we go. Um, is encouraging and allow, and allow car share. Um, uh, this is a, a proven way to reduce the amount of cars in a, in a neighborhood as well as the amount of car ownership and uh, folks who more uh, who don't necessarily buy a car but can use these cars are much more likely to take transit, ride a bike, and all that stuff. There's been a month, month amount of research behind that, um, and so as uh, as you all hopefully remember, you passed the uh, one way car share um, uh, policy a few weeks back, um, and so we're and we just got a staff member on board last week who uh, will be helping us run that program, um, and so we're really pushing on on how to get these kinds of things together. Um, but in this plan, we'll, we're looking for even more ways to, to make this happen. And of course, there's an, a huge list of other things, just kind of giving you a flavor for the direction we're going um, so that you have a sense of what we're doing. Um, here's the overall uh, plan timeline. We're just here kind of ending the identification of strategies to meet our goals um, and getting into that evaluation and, and making the, uh, uh, the strategies line up with community member stories and, and, and working with uh, community members to see uh, which ones are really uh, acceptable um, and which ones we can really go with. And with that, I will pass it off uh, to Wilson Tam to talk about multimodal transportation improvement plans and the very ESSA multimodal transportation improvement plan. Thank you, Ramses. Um, good afternoon, Chair, community member, and the general public. Uh, my name is Wilson Tam, uh, Transportation Planning Manager at DOT, and I'm very happy to uh, uh, accompany Ramses to report back about um, our CDY transportation plan, which Ramses just presented, as well as our multimodal transportation improvement planning effort. Um, the map that you see here is uh, a map of four area uh, multimodal transportation improvement plans that we are conducting right now. And the difference between an MTIP a short form for multimodal transportation improvement plans and uh, the access and mobile plan that Ramses presented just now um, is that uh, the MTIPs focus uh, in specific areas of the city where there will be an, uh, anticipated uh, significant growth in the next 20 years in the case of urban villages or downtown. So the four area transportation plans that we are working on right now are, um, as you can see in the middle, the downtown transportation plan, on the west side, we have the West San Jose Multimodal Improvement Plan. Um, on the east side, uh, we are very happy to have Council just adopted uh, the MFU Miendo, the East San Jose MTIP, just last uh, 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 early this year in February. And the focus of today's presentation is on the Berryessa MTIP, which is covered by the yellow boundary. Next slide, please, Ramses, and thank you for uh, doing the slide for me. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this map uh, shows uh, the, the, the rough study boundary of our Berryessa MTIP. The reason why we kick off this work roughly two years ago is because we know that the BART uh, phase one just completed and opened. We also know that uh, there will be a forthcoming uh, uh, update of the, uh, bear, uh, of the flea market rezoning application, as well as uh, the development of the um, Berryessa uh, BART Urban Village Plan which is later for council adoption on June 22nd. Um, therefore, uh, we kicked off this process two years ago to try to tag team with uh, our planning department to really think about how to maximize the big regional infrastructure that part phase one presents here 
to improve our multimodal connectivity in the bigger area. So the gray area um, is much beyond uh, the pink area. The pink area is our urban village plan boundary. And the gray area is roughly one mile buffer from the BART station. And that is the study boundary of our MTIP. So today, uh, there are roughly 200, I mean, uh, sorry, there are roughly 50,000 people living in the gray area. And we expect that the, the amount of population to be growing by another 60% in 20 years. And the majority of that growth obviously came, would come from the urban village plan boundary in the pink area. So we are talking about as many as 300,000 daily trips a day to and from the gray area. And we know that the existing transportation infrastructure is just not going to uh, be able to accommodate that many number of uh, uh, trips on a daily basis. Um, even with the bus station there, um, it's not going to make it. So we need to make it more multimodal and try to think about ways to uh, maximize the transmission options for people to travel around. Today, roughly 80% of the people drive alone and we would like to get that amount down to roughly 35% drive alone share in 2040. And this MTIP plan will be the, uh, one of the uh, early uh, phases of how to get there. So also shown in this map is our current on ongoing concurrent efforts. Um, we just mentioned about the urban village plan. Um, Zaheer uh, in our DOT just mentioned about our US 101 interchange planning process. Um, we also have a couple of upcoming development process such as the flea market rezoning application and also the Facino development as well. Next slide, please, Francis. Thank you. So um, the process by which we uh, conducted our MTIP planning process is a phased approach. We um, spent the first year um, or actually the last year uh, focusing in the urban village area because of the opportunity presented by the urban village planning process by PPCE. Um, so we, we worked with the planning department to think about how to maximize the transmission options in, within the urban village areas. Um, we identified it um, as many as 20 uh, transportation projects to be located within the uh, urban village area uh, shown on this map. Um, and they are color coded uh, by the various types of uh, transportation modes that the street projects will support. For example, the red streets are the transit oriented streets. Um, the, the green streets are the new trail connection. Um, the purple streets are the new bike uh, priority uh, streets, as well as some newer streets, uh, most of which are located within uh, the flea market district, as well as the Facino district. Um, we also um, are looking at um, the, uh, the new 101 interchange on the west side of this map. And uh, based on the initial understanding about the community values, CDY goals, as well as equity, uh, we have some understanding about where might be the appropriate location for the interchange. And we look forward to working with Zaheer, um, Caltrans, um, and the community uh, to identify uh, the appropriate location and the configuration of the new interchange at 101. Next slide, please. Besides the 20 transportation projects, we also identified it, um, a list of programs for implementation in the next 20 years within the urban village area. Knowing that parking and transportation congestion are the primary concerns by the community as it goes with the future growth in urban village and the bus station, um, we are happy to, um, to develop or establish or propose, I should say, because it's still stated for council consideration in June 22nd, um, a uh, TDM program or transportation demand management program to support the urban village. Um, we uh, propose to establish um, a, a transportation management association to help uh, provide uh, two TDM programs for future occupants within the urban village. And these two mandatory TDM programs are free transit passes for all future occupants in the urban village, as well as a marketing campaign to um, encourage people living in the urban village to take other modes of transportation. 
um, this TDM program also identifies a couple of um, mandatory TDM measures for future development to implement. For example, this program calls for all development in the urban village uh, to unbundle the parking from the residential development, as well as charge every single parking spaces um, in the urban village. Um, we also devise a list, um, or I should say devise a transportation demand management policy um, for development to implement based on uh, their parking provision. So the higher the parking amount they provide on site, the more the TDM measures they will have to implement. So we, so yeah, for example, um, ideas uh, of TDM programs that development can consider to fulfill their TDM requirement per the urban village plan include shared parking, um, a ride matching platform, bike share station, as well as uh, car share access and spaces to name a few. Next slide, please, Francis. So this is the timeline of our various MTIP. We are in summer 2021. Uh, we have just completed our um, collaboration with uh, our planning department on the Berryessa Urban Village Plan, which includes a total of 20 transportation projects and a TDM program for future implementation. And now we are ready to look at the broader area, which is the gray area of the MTIP, if you remember that very map, um, to look at the existing neighborhood surrounding the bar station, roughly one mile buffer from the bar station. And we are ready to uh, conduct a series of community activities and events to collect feedback from the community members about uh, their goals, values, and how their transmission options can be maximized. Um, we have recently launched an online survey just a week ago, and we are ready to uh, uh, call for our uh, 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 community members to help us uh, uh, understand uh, your values and goals and how we can provide the options, especially the access uh, to and from the bus station to your area. After the summer 2021, we will be ready to identify other transmission projects, programs, and policies to meet our MTIP goals. And we also anticipate that these projects, programs, and policies will be prioritized um, through an implementation strategy development to really understand what will be the, the, the appropriate phased approach to carry out these uh, uh, multimodal strategies. And we expect to complete uh, our draft, draft plan roughly winter 2022 with the expected uh, completion date with the final plan roughly in spring 2022, bringing forth it uh, to council consideration around that time. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. And Ramses and I are happy to answer any questions about the CDY transmission plan in the name of Access Mobility Plan as well as our anti planning process. Thank you. We'll go to members of the public first. The first person um, of public speakers is Catherine Hedges. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to the staff for their report. Um, and I speak both as, as a driver, as a person who lives in a building with a free transit pass who does use transit and a bicyclist. And um, it seems to take forever to get around on BTA. Um, the more I ride BTA while well, my car is broken down, the more I want to get the car fixed. And driving around downtown, both as a driver and as a bicyclist, the style of uh, bike lanes you have going through downtown are just not helpful. Um, People in wheelchairs have, you know, they, if they get an Uber or um, paratransit, they can't just roll up to the van and load in. They have to go down to the corner to a curb cut and then back up the bike lane to where the driver is. And meanwhile, the driver is getting mad at them for making them wait. And some drivers might even leave if they can't do it quickly enough. And it's going to affect uh, times and schedules so that people will be late and that's not fair it's not you know it violates their accessibility that they can't get 
directly from the curb to a vehicle with the bike lane between the curb and the parking. And um, so that's inaccessible for uh, dis disabled people. And for drivers, you can't really see the bicyclists until they pop out suddenly. And as a bicyclist, I don't like being the bicyclist who pops out suddenly and nearly gets hit. Um, they don't work. They had to reroute the buses. So now the, all the buses are jammed up on Santa Clara and they don't go, go down to San Fernando and it just hasn't worked. We need to not do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Roland. Thank you, Madam Chair. So before I move on to the uh, uh, the presentation itself, I, I noticed uh, Mr. Maru's audio equipment, which looked really impressive, but uh, I had severe difficulties hearing what Mr. Maru was saying. So I would uh, recommend that uh, he reaches out to Mr. Tam to help him out with his uh, audio difficulties. And in the meantime, his staff could enable closed captioning be much appreciated. Moving on uh, to the pre presentation, I do appreciate staff's interest and focus on uh, bike lanes, but this not, does not help seniors, including my neighbor, who died within hours of falling off his bike two years ago. Um, moving on to the multimodal um, transportation plans, um, I, I and other seniors would be really interested in learning how uh, they are expected to um, basically walk between the Blossom Hill Catherine Station and Coyote Creek without either getting killed or dying of exposure. Um, now, with regards to the, the specific plans, um, I think that a good start uh, for multimodal access to BARC would be the 101 to Maybury uh, interchange. And in uh, downtown, I think we should be prioritizing the design of the stations, specifically Dirondon downtown the 28th Street, before we raise billions of dollars on the gigantic tunnel on the Caltrain downtown San Jose, and then somehow try to figure out, you know, at some point in the, you know, uh, hopefully not too distant future, how people of all age, ages and abilities are going to be able to get in and out of this thing. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, Rajini, hopefully that's my third try at this. I'll get it someday, Rajini. Um, to go on with, uh, other, with it, the items on this uh, item, uh, uh, you know, there, it can cover a lot of ground. Uh, Thank you for the bicycle trails on the north side. Uh, hopefully the people of the flea market, I think that if they have design capabilities, how to design the future of the flea market, I think it could uh, work very well with the future of bike lane stuff. And that would be cool <laughs> and hopeful. Uh, I wish there was more uh, talk about uh, east side issues of bike lanes. There was a few maps that showed a road to San Antonio. That was interesting. How about you know San Antonio to downtown? from east side to downtown. How about from, uh, you know, across through district seven issues, uh, you know, from east to west. Uh, I, that kind of stuff I hope can be really talked about more. I, that's, that, that can be hopeful things to work on. Um, and for multimodal issues is the idea of AV use. That's been a, a, an important issue that east side uh, uh, officials have been working on. And I thank you for that. At this time, is it possible that there's been some talk to make a, a tunnel system from Deerdon to the airport? Can we concentrate on that being the AV system and leave the light rail alone and not, and not use that as an AV and concentrate just on the good practices of the light rail itself and that it, it's, it's an energy efficient system, a uh, green sustainable system, and, and we need that. And overall, you know, there's these are our good programs we've been working on for years. This is our best stuff and, and what is our sustainable future. So, you know, thank you for the efforts here. And um, I guess that's about it. And I hope I'm saying her name right, uh, Regini. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next speaker is Molly McLeod. Good afternoon. My name is Molly McLeod. Um, I wanted to speak on a couple issues raised in the memo. 
Um, one of them, uh, the focus on the access and mobility planning, um, the new mobility services. Um, in 2020, uh, Maddie Ruvolo, uh, a disabled uh, planner, uh, did a survey in San Francisco on perceptions of new mobility services. Um, and the finding of uh, 218 people who were surveyed, over 75% reported that improperly parked scooter or bike created mobility barriers for them. Um, we don't have that information. I think that that would be important uh, to have, certainly anecdotally, if um, you're traveling through the downtown area, for example, um, there are a lot of, of barriers. So since the focus of a lot of this work seems to be um, on mobility, um, that needs to be a, a part of it. I've appreciated the um, openness of Department of Transportation staff very recently of uh, gathering additional information, particularly from uh, the wide range of uh, people who are residents of San Jose and represent uh, dis different facets of the disability community. Um, another aspect of this is the proposal uh, with the uh, Knight Foundation um, grant about the robotic delivery. Um, that has been an issue in uh, other cities in terms of barriers on wheelchair access. I'd note that the um, company that was uh, listed as a partner has one of the least accessible websites that I've seen um, in, in checking it. So um, making sure that the lived experience, um, nothing about us without us is an important part of the design and it's actually one of the most effective and cheapest ways to go. Um, so I look forward to uh, further um, reports that have a greater representation of disability insights and expertise um, at the next presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Colin, user one. This mass transit, stop where you're at. It's a waste of money. Have you ever seen anybody on it? Light rail, buses, you know, I've driven around, you know, light rail always, you know, causes the traffic to back up and there's nobody on it. I've seen it around rush hour, around where I work, or well, where I used to work. I work from home now, but but uh, it doesn't work very well. It's not going to. This was designed for cars. It's unfortunate. It really is. I mean, I used to live in Madrid, Spain. I never had a, I never had a car. I didn't need one. The way the city was designed and this, you know, the the country was under great leadership for like 40 years under Franco. I mean, he made sure that the, the metro worked. Uh, even Henry Kissinger thought it was amazing. But I regress. Look, at, you're not going to do anything with mass transit. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. Nobody uses it. It's expensive to use. It's expensive for the taxpayer. It doesn't work. I mean, you're going to use this transit to go to San Francisco. Uh, it's going to it cost a lot of money. It's so slow. The Caltrain is slow. That's been delayed. The, the, ele the fast electrical speed train has been delayed another couple of years. The light rail is terrible. And has anyone ever taken it to to Levi Stadium, it's a joke. It takes hours to get there, hours to line up when you want to leave. Uh, it's just terrible. Everybody thinks, it, it, I mean, it, they think it's so sexy to have all this mass transit. It's not. Who's going to be riding bikes? People don't ride bikes everywhere. The, the Rose Garden has put up a brand new bike rack when they should have rebuilt the bathrooms that look like uh, something third world. No one. I've never seen one bike parked at the bike bike racks. I go to the Rose Garden all the time. Uh, Deb, are you listening? Your Rose Garden, terrible. Uh, fix the bathrooms at the Rose Garden before you do anything. Um, yeah, I, pave the roads first, for God's sake. The potholes everywhere. You know, what are they, they're going to reap. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, phone number ending in eight zero zero seven. Hello? You're unmuted. We're not able to hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank ah, you. excellent. So, 
Woo. Okay, so my name is Christine Fitzgerald, Community Advocate, Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. Um, I have had a tremendous um, joy in working with the uh, Access and Mobility Plan and uh, working towards making uh, San Jose and uh, uh, areas surrounding San Jose more accessible for more people. Um, I like to continue to urge for uh, full mobility and full access in the sense of uh, we're looking at the uh, the um, the separation from traffic for bikes. I understand that, and I fully approve of it. I <laughs> I would still hold uh, a fair amount of concern with the uh, concept of island islanding. Uh, trying to get it out of a, a, a bus onto the island in a wheelchair uh, in a safe manner has to be seriously looked at, especially if the island is only so large versus so large plus that you need a place to land a chair and get out and move versus maybe falling off of the island. Um, the other thing that I would like to uh, to point out, as uh, Molly uh, just pointed out, um, access also looks at, should look at um, uh, ease of movement on the sidewalks as well. So self-directed, uh, self-driving uh, delivery systems should be um, considered, of course, but also looking at the way that the two uh, groups, if you will, so the, the delivery system and the person needing access. I'm sorry, the sentence seemed to get cut off. It sounded like it was about the um, automated vehicles on, um, like delivery vehicles on sidewalks and how they are going to interface with people in wheelchairs or, or who are uh, mobility limited on sidewalks. So we'll, we'll cover that. I'll have a question about that when, um, when we get back to the committee. But we have one more public speaker, Michelle Mashburn. Hi, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Also thank City of San Jose and the workers that have put so much energy into evaluating the transportation plan. I want to remind everybody that the disabled population is a very, very diverse group and representation from one group or one organization does not necessarily equate to full and adequate representation of disabled people's needs. If a survey or a outreach is not including the measure of disability on what you're trying to create feedback in, people with disabilities are actually not invited to be a part or a voice in that survey. And that's another important feature to remember. The 20 minute city is actually a form of echo ableism and urban gentrification against people with disabilities. Um, it leaves disabled people behind. One solid example of this is the bike lanes in downtown San Jose and the ongoing struggle that I personally have had in getting parking as well as getting onto and off from paratransit vehicles in front of my place of residence. Um, also, it's important to note that in different communities, parking may still be required. So getting, you know, making those changes to be more focused on transit, it's not always feasible as a disabled person to take transit to and from every single location that I need to go to. So I end up having to take off from work because I can't get to my doctor's appointment in a timely manner because paratransit or public transit requires that much more time to do. Everybody needs to start including disability and I did see glimpses of that in the report and I'm very appreciative of that. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Turning back to the committee, does anyone have comments or questions on this item? Council member Cohen. Just wanted to thank staff for this uh, report um, and, and thank you um, 
as always for the very uh, Ramses for your very thoughtful presentations on uh, on these kinds of um, you know innovative ways of looking at transportation. Um, I, I'm excited that the to see the the various urban village come together um, with a, with what I think will be kind of a model for how we do these kinds of um, multimodal transportation uh, setups. And there's a lot of, of great things in there. Um, and uh, um, I appreciated what you were showing Wilson about you know what what's expected at that site. And I look forward to the to the community process going forward um, to talk to our residents about what they want to see in this transportation plan. And I, I, I'm looking forward to to seeing all the pieces of this urban village come together. So that's all I want to say, and I want to move the report. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for your presentation too, and uh, glad to see that Transit First is moving forward. Uh, although uh, Transit First needs to move a little bit faster, but I certainly understand the things that are are in the way of it moving forward, but I'm really glad to hear that it is uh, in a forward direction and not going backwards. I just wanna echo the comments of those members of the disability community who are always advocating on behalf of the community that has difficulty in getting around. As someone who had difficulty getting around myself, I had a knee that was really painful. I needed a cane wherever I was. I recognize how hard it is to get up and down a sidewalk, uh, a curb, how, crossing a street in a timely manner. And then you have these people zipping past you who don't realize how, uh, how difficult it is for you to move. So I'm very sensitive to members of the community who are not as mobile as other community members, particularly the, um, the uh, uh, scooters and things that are stuck in the middle of a corner that everyone thinks that's cool and that's great place to drop it, but it's nothing more than a hindrance for an individual to get around, whether you're in a cane, a wheelchair, or just not able to walk as fast as other people around you. So I appreciate the advocates, uh, Molly, Christine, and Michelle for always being out there, uh, and Catherine Hedges too, to advocate. And uh, I, I hear you and I hope that we are tremendously looking at access issues. So can you reassure me that we are not that we are speaking to all members of the disability community and not just one because the the motto nothing about us without us is really important and we need to make sure that we are embracing all of their inputs because as they mentioned there's different levels of of uh, disabilities that we need to take into consideration yeah council member john rista director of transportation and the the easy answer is yes the harder answer is how we can do this. And I think we're fully uh, intending to actually expand not, not only our knowledge, but actually how we do this outreach and then how we transition that actually into better projects on the ground, because that's where it makes the most difference. So there's a number of things we're, we're learning and I really want to thank the same speakers because we're actually in much closer connection and conversation with all of them to actually figure out how we can do better um, it starts with, with understanding what the issue is, and we're, we're trying to do that. We've started to do this. I think we've got a, quite a ways to go to get all the way through that, but it's really helpful to actually hear from some of, the, some of the people that are actually experiencing it, and then advocates that are really working towards making all of our agency functions actually be more responsive to that. So it is something we are definitely serious about and want to get better at. So thanks for bringing that up too. I appreciate that. So when we talk about equity in relation to transportation, we need to make sure that that absolutely includes all members of the disabled community and seniors too. Seniors, uh, many of them may not feel that they have mobility issues, but they do. Some of them who are 90, 95, still walking around the streets are a little bit slower than they were when they were 85. So we just need to be sensitive and aware and you know, you hear every, uh, you hear daily about how someone who is injured who was a little bit slow crossing the street. So we need to be 
just really sensitive and pay attention and continue to advocate and uh, put things in place that our streets are safe for all. Thank you, that's it for me. Thank you. I, I also wanna thank uh, the staff for, for this report and, and uh, Ramses, I know we kind of beat up on you a little bit every time you talk about the access and mobility plan, um, but that's because it's so important. And I did wanna to kind of underscore what council member Foley was saying when when we talked about the goals the last time you brought this to us we were really clear that we wanted to make sure that there was um inclusion of disability in the goals and i i went through i didn't go through the website so so tell me if if the figure one that talks about the access and mobility plan goals is is not complete because there isn't anything specifically in there about uh, Americans with Disabilities Act or, or people with disabilities or mobility challenges. So I see the access for all, but it says, especially in historically underserved communities, it doesn't talk about populations that have mobility challenges. Uh, thank you for that. And, and, and we'll make sure to, that it gets in there. That's definitely the, the category it should be in. And you're right that it's, it is language in there is more focused on, on kind of the I would say the popular version of equity right now, which has to do with with racial and, and um, economic issues. Um, and uh, we've, we've missed your direction there. I apologize. We'll make sure it gets in there. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I completely agree that that historically underserved communities is, is appropriate to, to be included in there. Just wanted to make sure that um, that people with disabilities are also included and called out, because if they're not called out, it's it's kind of what gets um, what gets measured gets attention, right? It's the squeaky wheel issue. So I want to make sure that's in there. Um, and to that, to that point, one of the speakers, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one was talking about, um, the, the delivery. I don't know what they're called. I can never remember what they're called, but I saw one in Mountain View one time when I was up there, um, those little delivery cubes that are kind of automated. And it actually, it was funny. It was, there was a pedestrian there, um, walking along and I couldn't tell if the if the cube was following the pedestrian, like if he was with the pedestrian um, until he passed, until the he, the delivery cube passed the person uh, and then went along on its own on its own way. But how would how would that work? How does that work with someone who has a walker who's in a wheelchair? What what's the interface on on the sidewalk between those kinds of like delivery robots and and people. Great. So I, I will. I want to make a differentiation, and then I'll ask your question. Answer your question. So um, there is a project that's funded by Knight Foundation. Um, it's a nationwide project to do um, experiments with sidewalk delivery robots um, uh, with the company KiwiBots. Um, and thanks for the comment about the earlier from I think it was Kristen um, who pointed out, or Molly actually who pointed out that their website is not accessible. We'll have to work with them on that. Um, but we're doing this experiment specifically to learn these things, right? Is what are what how, are these things feasible in the urban environment? What are the things we need to learn about them to make it feasible? What are the the requirements we might need to put on them um, so that they can actually get out of the way? Um, so that's that. We're also we also have the emerging mobility plan, which is looking at scooters um, and other other uh, devices of that sort, um, and specifically from the lens of of equity and how do we make these things more useful to folks um, and we got to make sure that the disability voice is being heard there as well um, so that's the differentiation a little bit of the answer to the question but then the further answer is um, the kiwi bots are only semi-autonomous which means that they can kind of go in a straight line they can avoid objects uh, but they're actually controlled by someone uh, back in Colombia, actually um, uh, uh, the companies <laughs> that's where they're based. Um, and so they pay people in Colombia to, to steer them whenever they have a, a, a more significant issue they can't get around. Now, okay. um, so there's, there's a, a kind of fail safe there to some degree. Um, that's, I'm not sure if that's the same case. The Mountain View have the Starship ones. They're much bigger um, than the ones we're going to be having here, at least the models we've seen so far um, and all that. And so I, I, I we are investigating this technology. We're investigating whether it's feasible on our streets and we're investigating what are the, the policies we need to put in place to, to, to if they are, uh, to make sure that we're not ending up with just even more clutter on the sidewalk. Because we know 
the scooters are already a challenge and we'll, you know, we do our, we, we work a lot with that, try to figure that out. So um, yeah, we're, I would say the answer is we don't totally know yet, um, but we are in the process of figuring it out with the world, right? Um, and and how, okay. do you, how do you do this? Thanks. And um, I did see you had um, the, the table that I mentioned with the goals in the description, those don't look like measurable goals to me. Um, they're, <laughs> Jess is smiling. She, she knows what I'm going to say. They're not smart goals. Do we have this in a smart goal format so that they're actually something that we can measure over time? And then what's the plan for reporting, collecting and reporting this information? Yeah, great. So each the way that's given there specifically the kind of human readable version. Each one of these has a KPI, um, at least two. I'm not human, Ramthus. No, no, you're great. You're great. Um, but you're saying the the machine version of this, right? The data version of this. Sorry, <laughs> um, is is key performance indicators, and those pre key performance indicators. Um, we're, we've uh, we can send you that table as well. I believe it was in our last report um, to you on on the Axon Mobility Plan too. Okay. Um, those key performance indicators are the, the, the measurable versions of these, um, and, and we're working through, are they actually measurable? Do we actually have the data to do that? Um, and we're going through a whole process of, of finding new data sets and stuff like that to, to be able to do that. And we will very much have an ongoing data platform um, to, that'll be available to the public and, and, and council, um, and then a uh, a, a dorky wonky version for us staff um, that looks at it um, and, and will keep us on track. Um, and the whole point of it is just the end of the accident mobility plan is not just a report that says these are, these are the kind of things we need to do. It's going to be actually the system that's going to use those key performance indicators um, and give us a continuous update, both a report card looking back as well as uh, uh, um, uh, uh, looking forward saying which projects are actually the most valuable in terms of meeting the various um, uh, uh, goals um, that we have here. Okay, that's really helpful. And then I thought I heard you say, uh, I, the report says uh, over 50 community meetings and you said you're a 10th of the way there. Yeah, we're this week will be uh, through our fifth or sixth. We've already done, okay. oh, this is our second round, right? So um, okay. we're just in the midst of it. Yeah, and so I know we're working with your office. Everybody else's office has been really great um, getting, um, helping us find the right groups and everything so yeah okay good good and then so what's the timeline on completing the plan yeah the hope is to be able to bring it uh this winter to council for adoption okay thank you i know you had a a slide and i missed i missed the end point um appreciate that does anyone else have any comments or questions if not, we're ready for the vote to accept the report. Foley? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. And thank you. So we'll move on to item four, the city street sweeping status report. John, who's up for this one? Yeah, thank you very much. And we're ready for the last item. Um, John Russell, Director of Transportation. We have Rick Scott, our Deputy Director, and two Division Managers, Eric Hahn and Jennifer Sagan. Each one is going to have a role. The, they have a role in managing the street sweeping in the city of San Jose. So, Rick, I think you're going to take it away. Yep. I'll go first, over John. to Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, John and Rick. Um, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Sagan, DOT Division Manager for Sanitary and Storm Sewer Operation and Maintenance. I also manage the city's in-house street sweeping program. So uh, next, I'm sure you're aware that city streets are designed to convey water to the curb and gutters and then the storm drains, which carry water untreated into local creeks, waterways, and ultimately the San Francisco Bay. So the 1972 Clean Water Act initiated the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, to protect these waterways. And the city's sanitary and storm sewer operations are regulated by two separate NPDES permits. You heard an update on the municipal regional stormwater permit earlier in the meeting. Street sweeping is included in that permit as a best practice whose purpose is to remove pollutants, including sediment, nutrients, such as fertilizers and animal waste, toxic metals such as copper from car brake pads, and organic material from entering storm drains and polluting local waterways. Next slide, please. 
So street sweeping in San Jose is delivered using a hybrid approach. This includes both staff and equipment employed and owned by the city and contracted services. This hybrid model allows the city to cost effectively and flexibly deploy resources 24 hours per day as needed. The contracted residential street sweeping or RSS program is operated by Green Waste Recovery Inc, the same contractor that delivers yard waste collection services. This program is responsible for sweeping approximately 36,000 curb miles per year, mainly in residential areas. This represents approximately 54% of the total miles swept annually. Streets are swept once a month during the day and spot cleaned as needed under that program. Approximately 24% of the miles have parking restriction signs and the Green Waste contract includes delivery of up to 20 enhanced sweeps per year. City crews sweep streets overnight during the graveyard shift and they are responsible for sweeping approximately 31,000 curb miles of major arterial and connector roads, bikeways and business districts, including the downtown area. Approximately 50% of the miles in that program have parking restriction signs. Next slide, please. Now the city street sweeping crew includes staff employed by the city and equipment owned by the city. This includes a special bikeway sweeper, which you can see in the picture on the right. And the city team conducts routine sweeping and responds to debris removal requests and emergency cleanup requests from police and fire. Examples of that are in the other two pictures, um, including sweeping streets after car accidents, fires, and large protests or rallies. Next, Eric will provide some more detail about the residential street sweeping program. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Eric Hahn, and I'm the Landscape and Traffic Maintenance Division Manager within DOT's Infrastructure Maintenance Division. As mentioned earlier, the Residential Street Sweeping Program, RSS, provides monthly street sweeping in residential streets throughout the city using green waste. DOT inspection staff oversee the in-field sweeping inspections while the Environmental Services Department manages the green waste contract. DOT's inspection team ensures the neighborhood sweeping routes are getting swept. This means every route is completed and sweepers are being effective getting up against the curb and not leaving any debris behind or driving too fast. Inspectors also identify obstructions such as parked cars, low hanging tree branches and items left in the street. Uh, inspectors also assist property owners by providing information on sweeping frequencies and responding to questions or concerns. Inspectors work closely with the parking compliance team to coordinate for enhanced sweeps and other special cleanup efforts. Lastly, the inspection team tracks requests for street sweeping signage and conduct parking impact studies to determine if the requested locations meet the street sweeping signage criteria. Next slide, please. The images in this slide show some of the most common issues that impact street sweeping. Large debris piles must be avoided by sweeper operators because there can be hidden items within the piles that damage sweeper equipment or cause other problems. In a recent incident, there was a piece of metal that was buried in leaves, and when the sweeper attempted to collect the leaves, the metal was diverted back towards the sidewalk and struck a pedestrian. When there are large debris piles, residents should contact the RSS program, and inspection staff will schedule a cleanup to address the issue. Staff can request a follow-up sweep or call upon another program to provide a one-time cleanup. Another common sweeping issue are trees with branches that hang below 14 feet over the street. The sweepers cannot get under the low hanging branches and risk damaging the sweepers. When there's a low hanging tree, the in inspector will forward the location to the arborist staff who generate a notice to the property owner, letting them know that tree pruning is needed. The middle picture on this slide shows the impact of parked vehicles. Parked cars are probably the greatest impediment to street sweeping. One parked car results in nearly three car lengths of space that can't be swept because the sweepers just aren't maneuverable. Street sweeping signage is one way to address parked cars. However, signage can only be installed when funding is available. Enhanced sweeps are another option that can remind and encourage residents to move vehicles on sweep days. Next slide. When the shelter in place went into effect, street sweeping was deemed an essential service and continued but parking enforcement was suspended because the parking compliance staff was reassigned to perform other essential services. As a result, street sweeping effectiveness was severely impacted because there were a lot more cars on the street since residents were now working from home. 
The in-house program was also impacted by staff redeployment. Some outlying areas were swept less frequently because sweepers needed to reroute to dump at corporation yards instead of in streets, but these areas were still monitored and swept on an as-needed basis. On the residential side, Greenways continued sweeping the neighborhood streets during shelter in place, and inspection staff focused their efforts on identifying obstructions and being more proactive in removing debris piles in the streets. Inspection staff also coordinated several cleanup areas around the city to keep debris buildup in the streets to a minimum. This concludes my portion of the presentation, so back over to you, Rick. Thanks, Eric. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Rick Scott, DOT Deputy Director. We report on two key effectiveness measures as shown in this chart. The green bars represent our own assessments of the sweeps, and these assessments are performed by Jennifer's management staff and Eric's inspectors using the sheet shown on attachment A of the memo. This data is aggregated and provides us with the total percentage you see uh, on this chart. Our target as shown on the far right is to have 75% of streets rated as a four or better on a five point scale. We were unable to reach that goal last year for many of the reasons discussed by Eric and issues were exacerbated this year with COVID. So we anticipate lower performance so these numbers are not yet finalized. The blue bar represents the results of a resident survey performed by ESD, which is updated every other year. The number you see here, 45%, reflects resident responses from last year's survey. Although the number is lower than our target, it still reflects an improvement from the previous survey, which was closer to 40%. The methods of assessment vary between city teams and our residents, but by and large, it appears that we are seeing similar things in the field, and we have work to do as a city to improve the effectiveness of this service. Oops. Uh, we also pay close attention to route completion. If our program is 100% successful, we have swept 67,000 curb miles across the various types of street in a given year. The chart you see here shows a decade of performance on mileage completion. We have a system called telematics on most DOT vehicles, including sweepers, that allows us to see the location and speed of a vehicle at a given time. If we receive a complaint that a certain area on one of our in-house routes hasn't been swept, it is very easy for us to determine whether the sweeper was present in the area as a sign. Our contractual routes are spot checked every day by our inspectors to ensure that areas are being swept satisfactorily. Although Green Waste has not yet adopted this telematics system I mentioned, its new contract allows us to negotiate additional compensation if the city desires to exercise that option, and staff is currently exploring this. Most of the missed miles this past year can be attributed to staffing challenges resulting from COVID and accompanying redeployments on the in-house program, but we have seen an improvement over the past few months and expect to see better results this coming year. In 2016, the city auditor analyzed the street sweeping program for effectiveness and efficiency. 14 recommendations were provided to DOT, of which 11 have been fully adopted. You can see the entire summary as attachment B. DOT is making progress in the final three recommendations. It has been a long-standing practice to have in-house sweepers dump waste into staging areas on the street to be picked up later in the shift. This does not occur on the contractual side because Green Waste provides dumpsters for this staging. DOT has been able to hire the necessary staff to implement this recommendation and is working with Public Works Fleet Services to procure the required equipment. We hope to complete this goal in the coming fiscal year. The next recommendation below involves our electronic inspection system, which has been successfully deployed to all city employees. The final open item here is the installation of a telematic system on Greenway sweepers, which I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. This recommendation cannot be implemented without additional funding and is a candidate for a budget request next fiscal year. The final recommendation involves the continual update and improvement of routing and sweeping schedules. I will start with bullet B here. Um, the auditor's office recommended we perform more enhanced sweeps, which are very effective at cleaning problem locations on a one-time basis. In the recent contract update, the number of enhanced sweeps per year increased from nine to 20, so this element of the recommendation is accomplished. Recommendation C is also completed. The DOT in-house staff and contractual staff have monthly coordination meetings where the efficient deployment the resources we have at our disposal is discussed and determined. Recommendation A is the most challenging one to accomplish. The fact is residential streets would benefit from more frequent sweeps. A substantial budget ad would be required to increase its frequency and many more parking signs would also need to be installed and enforced to ensure the effectiveness of these sweeps. DOT will continue to work to provide the most efficient and effective service that it is funded to provide. This final slide provides the public with a website where sweep days and other utility services can be looked up. We find that pointing people to this ESD managed site can often answer questions regarding sweep days and times. And the image here is just a screenshot of that site. 
Um, the challenges with street sweeping did not originate with COVID or the city response, but they were certainly exacerbated in this past year. For example, we had to make choices whether to tow the cars of our neighbors sheltering in place to ensure an effective sweep or to allow them to shelter in place without being ticketed. There are consequences to those choices. But we've been fortunate to have some successful recruitments recently uh, on Eric's team and on Jennifer's team. And we believe that as the city emerges from pandemic response, we will be able to make progress in meeting the standards for our current level of funding. Thank you for your time and our team is happy to take your questions. Thank you. We'll go to members of the public first. Catherine Hedges. Um, good afternoon, committee. Um, well, thank you very much for not towing people's cars during shelter in place. Um, another problem I've noticed with the, bike, the protected bike lanes is that the street sweepers can't get to the bike lanes, so it's full of broken glass. And it's no good having a bike lane if it's uh, full of road hazards, broken glass, broken bottles, junk, scooters, Everything ends up in the bike lane and you can't be swept. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we make sure to have the timer available? Next speaker is call in user one. Call in user one. Yeah, start me off at two minutes because this Zoom is terrible. My God, this thing's never work. Anyway, look, at trying, trying to clean the streets here is like trying to polish a turd. The streets are terrible. There's trip hazards in the street where the gutters are. Uh, there's abandoned cars that never get moved. They never get towed. They never get ticketed. It's just a money maker. When you put up those street cleaning signs downtown, what eyesores it is everywhere. It looks like garbage. That's just what I want in my neighborhood, a street sweeper sign, you know, to try to get people to get ticketed so you can revenue us even more. That's what it's for, by the way, everybody. It's not because of the Clean Water Act. It's got nothing to do with it. They do that downtown to generate tickets so they can – they can have a gotcha moment on the third Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock in the morning. Somebody inadvertently parks their car down there, gets a nice fat ticket from from the fat ticket givers down there. They're, they're all they're yeah, all. Can you turn some fucking signs? Huh? Say again. <laughs> Say what? Someone laughing over there? Please continue or complete your point. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, look, it's, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. I don't want any signs in my neighborhood telling me when I can and can't park. It's a joke. It does, the, the streets aren't clean. It, it's everything that this city does is wrong. So keep doing what you're doing because it's actually comical to see all the wrong decisions that the city makes. It's comical to see how much money is wasted on pie in the sky, things like this, trying to keep the streets clean for what? For so so we we don't have to see the damaged part of the streets that are terrible. And by the way, when are you gonna fix the rose gardens? Thank you. Our final speaker is Blair Beekman. And Catherine Hedges, you are unmuted, by the way. We, we need to thank you, Blair. Oh, sorry, boy, I, I did my unmute and then I did that again. So sorry about that. Um, with this issue, uh, street sweepers, uh, you know, four, five, six years ago now, <laughs> this issue was about, uh, you know, they wanted to put a AOPRs and street sweepers uh, like San Francisco sometimes does. Um, it was uh, rejected at the time. I don't know where this issue is at these days. And do you have the open public policy practices that if I 
ask someone at City Hall about this subject, they can readily pass that information along to myself? Or will it be a matter that I have to go through a bunch of hoops and a bunch of bureaucratic fear and mumbo jumbo, and nobody really wants to talk about it, but you know it's possible and we're not sure, but maybe. And if we have open public policies for these things, it could just be a very simple process that I can ask and you can answer, yes, you do. And uh, you know work from that point of view. Uh, it's a much better way to work and uh, I'm going to have to be asking your city hall about this question. And uh, for some people, it's easier, but for some people, it's more difficult. And I wish there could be just a uniform system that it could be simple for both the public and government to be able to answer this sort of question, because nobody, everyone's too afraid to answer this question in San Jose. We have to learn how to be open and straightforward and, and direct with each other about it. And there can be ways to do it. And open public policies really helps that process. And um, so thanks for this item. I'm going to try to say, uh, <laughs> I can't say her name, but thanks for your patience and putting me putting up with trying, me trying to learn to say uh, Rosini's name. Thanks. Thank you. Turning back to the committee, does anyone have any questions or comments? Move to accept the report. Second. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple. I, first of all, why don't we just save Blair some time? And um, I'll call on you in just a second, Councilmember Cohen. Why don't we save Blair some time? And I'll just ask, are there automated license plate readers on garbage trucks or street sweepers? Not that I know of. <laughs> yeah, not not on the residential <laughs> side yeah. for sure, and I doubt on the in the house uh, sweeping side as well. Yeah, no, definitely Thank not. You. And is no, there any? No. Is there any? Has there been any movement to do so? I didn't see anything, and I'm on rules, so I would guess that it would come through me. No. All right, Councilmember Cohen, you can prove me wrong if you remember oh. something coming in the last few months. Nothing recently. Thanks, Councilmember. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I just had a quick question. You're you're um curb miles calculation, that's based on the number of passes, right? It's not just that, is that how it is done? Exactly, okay. yep. So for the ones that are done every day, that that's- yeah. That counts every time you do that mile. Okay, I just wanted to Correct. understand the number. Okay, thank you. All right, a um, couple of questions for me. Um, the Is there a plan for complete service restoration? There was, a, there was in the report, it mentioned that um, parking compliance had problems with staffing the graveyard shift after in the kind of the aftermath of COVID? Yeah, I know that Heather, I think Heather's online for the questions, but I will just share that uh, the PTCOs I know have been doing a lot um, for various projects, including manning some of our security checkpoints at the Mayberry Yard, for example. So they've been all over and have been unable to staff up on grave shift. We are working on a plan right now, um, both of our divisions within DOT to kind of complete that transition to allow for graveyard parking enforcement. So hopefully we're about a month away from that being able to be rolled out, but maybe Heather can speak to some of the potential challenges in that timeline um, if she's on for a call. I'm sorry, my daughter is unhappy downstairs. That's okay. I am oh. here. Uh, Heather Hoshi, uh, Division Manager over parking compliance, downtown operations. Um, Rick is correct. Uh, both his department and my group are working on kind of a timeline to re-engage the overnight parking um, specifically for street over sweeping. We do, are doing um, a little bit of overnight parking. Um, we don't have enough staff because as Rick mentioned, we are redeployed in several areas um, and we are hoping to get those officers back so we can um, move forward with um, ensuring street sweeping is, is enforced overnight as well. And so that's still pandemic related redeployment? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I, I understood exactly. Um, and then just a couple of things. Rick, you had mentioned um, revising the schedule and routes and would mean increasing the the frequency in neighborhoods. And I want and you said it would it would be a substantial budget increase. What are we talking about in terms of numbers? Do we have an estimate on what that would cost? You know, it's not something that's really been contemplated before. So I would say in this next budget process, we could come up with an estimate. 
Um, I know that as you add miles, you know, each, each route is kind of a distinct um, set of challenges for Greenway. So I couldn't just say, what would it take for, you know, 36,000 miles? Uh, you know, it would be, yeah. well, that route has this going on, that route has this going on. So it'd be a pretty complicated process. Um, and I, and, you know, I do know that they, they collapsed from, it's been for some time that it's been once per month. I think since about 2003, it, yeah. it's gone down to, to once per month. Well, and I don't, I mean, I guess if we're not getting, hitting all of our miles anyway, I sort of have the, the sense that what's the point of increasing, increasing the number of miles if we're not even meeting our goal right now. Um, but I, but I'm also wondering because the, con the contractors don't have telematics, how do we know that they're hitting all their miles? Or we do have a we couple of ways. So I'll, I'll start and then Eric may be able to provide more details. Um, but we, um, we basically spot check their work every day. So our, our inspectors have uh, a list of, of routes that are expected to be gone on that day. And then they randomly select the routes to inspect. And we've typically found that they, they go, I mean, they, they do the routes as assigned and that the real challenge we find is these impediments to the sweeper. So the, the parked cars and, and the, you know, even the curb and gutter can be a challenge sometimes in the lower trees. But um, Eric, do you have any specific uh, additional things that our inspectors look for when they're assessing the completion of a route? Um, they also look for the uh, effectiveness of the sweep in terms of how fast the operators are going. Um, you know, and then I think you covered all the impediments. So I think that's it. But so far the reports are, they are completing their routes um, and they've actually go out regularly. The Green Race is actually quite responsive too um, in doing re-sweeps or doing some special cleanups. So we've actually done a couple of those in district six too recently. I think Morello was a recent one and some other locations. Thanks. Um, and then in terms of the, the telematics on the contracted sweepers, does that tell you the speed that they go? It could. And that, that's what the um, that's what our in-house one tells us. It, it is able to tell us the speed. It still would not, you know, the issue with telematics is it's kind of a piece of the overall puzzle because you still don't know the effectiveness of those sweeps. And that's why the 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 mileage and the inspection kind of results are both kind of go hand in hand as for how as far as yeah. how we an, analyze the success of our program. So it could tell us those two elements. Was it there and how fast it was going? It couldn't really tell us how effective that sweep was. We'd still need that oversight. Sure, that makes sense. And then do we have a sense of what the additional funding would be to add the telematics on the contracted? We don't yet, um, but I know that the, through the sweeping coordination meetings, uh, um, Eric and Jennifer are, and ESD are trying to determine that cost. So we at least have an idea as to what to expect, um, you know, to put us in a position whether to make a, a cost benefit decision, if it makes sense. Okay. And then uh, what are we doing to proactively publicize when street sweeping happens in each neighborhood? On that, you know, I know there's a lot of flyer distribution, but I think, um, you know, Eric is more closer to the RSS program. So if there's anything to add, Eric, beyond our website and our frequent outreach, um, please feel free. Uh, nothing to add at this time, but that's basically it. It's the flyering. And then we do additional outreach. If we were to do an enhanced sweep, um, we'll go flyer the neighborhoods and knock on doors. Okay. Is there any way, um, and I'm happy to be a pilot on this one, if if you're interested, Eric, we have access to next door and it's by, we can do it limited by neighborhood, not in our district. Um, so we don't have to just do the entire district. So if we wanted to do some kind of a schedule by neighborhood where we would let people know maybe one or two days in advance that street sweeping is happening on, on next door. Maybe we could get some better compliance with getting people, getting people to have their cars off of those streets. Maybe I'm just putting that yeah. out there is since that seems to be a barrier and the, the one parked car obstructing three car lengths is a big deal. And if that's impeding our metrics, then maybe we could try that. Yeah, we can certainly work with your office to kind of come up with a plan and see how we can kind of roll this out. Okay, great. Council Member Cohen? I just wanted to second your idea because it, it occurs to me that most people don't know which days the street sweeper comes through. I mean, I don't know when it comes on my street. So being able to maybe spend some time in these first few months, next few months, um, actually sending out messages, please move your car tomorrow. Your, you know, your neighborhood is getting swept. 
we might actually be able to get more voluntary compliance. I don't know if people are intentionally blocking the street sweepers. I think they just don't know when they're supposed to move their cars. Yeah, so and, I just, and I'll tell you, I do know that ours is first Friday, um, mostly because we just had it. And I remember seeing the sweeper when I was walking the dog, but I never remember, you know, the night before. Right. Because it happens That's, once a month. It's not like every week yeah. with with like with garbage. Um, and we used to have a neighbor neighborhood Yahoo group where somebody had it automated that the the day we our garbage day is Thursday and then and then Friday is the sweet sweep street sweeping day. Somebody had it automated that always the first Thursday we would get a notice tomorrow is street sweeping day. And we were much better about moving our vehicles and making sure they were off the street when we had that monthly reminder. Yeah, and ideally we'd have signs in all the streets that say this street is this is the street sweeping day, but obviously getting to that point will be expensive and could take a long time. Because I when I lived in Berkeley, we had that on our street. So we had we moved our car. Um, and I know that's true in New York. You walk on the streets, you see signs that say which which this side of the street will be swept. You have to move your car on this day. And so Anyway, I think there's a lot we can do just to improve results without huge, ex without much expense. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting some kind of route info that we can easily decipher as a district office, yep. you know, as an office um, of information. Yeah, I think that, that would be great. You know, I think the biggest thing we struggle with is the staff to actually proactively do that kind of outreach. So those council, you know, council offices, if that's a, if that's a resource we can leverage, I think that's a great idea. In the meantime, as that gets navigated, the website from the last slide has the lookup tool. So that could be just a quick thing to share for people to look up. But I, I agree, yeah. a proactive, you know, pinging would absolutely uh, probably increase compliance. And one thing I'll add, sorry, just I've been a part of the sign issue for a long time. That's It's surprisingly controversial, um, you know, installing street <laughs> signs. They, that, that is a, that some neighborhoods that you would think would be all for it, don't want it at all, and vice versa sometimes. So that, that can be pretty challenging. Um, but I don't think there's any doubt that street signs would increase compliance. It is it is visual clutter, so I understand. And we had one uh, public commenter who in their um, comment mentioned that it, there is visual clutter there. I almost wonder if proactively texting people would be probably, it would probably be the best thing. Um, but I don't know, I don't know that we have that capability, but that's something maybe we could shoot for in the long term. Um, Thank you. Council Member Cohen, did you have any more? No, that's oh, it. You took your hand on. Okay, great. I think we're ready for the vote. Foley? Aye. Ms. Barza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thanks. That motion carries. We'll move on to open forum. We have a couple of members of the public who want to speak. Blair Beekman? Hi, uh, thank you, Council Person Davis, for the clarification about street sweepers and garbage trucks. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, for this item, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the Vision Zero Task Force and the S S Smart Cities Committee of last week. Um, you know, Vision Zero, they're handling, handling a lot of uh, neighborhood safety issues and with four and 5G, they're getting a ton new uh, four and 5G that's got like surveillance capabilities for neighborhood safety concerns. Uh, Kip Harkness it was asked by Council Person Perales, I think, about what, what's the stat current status of a uh, streetlight surveillance tech. And Kip gave kind of a fib of an answer, and it wasn't too impressive. And I think I need to bring that out here now that. He mentioned ideas of you know privacy policy and they're they're, they're creating privacy policies for the streetlights, for the system so the public can ask questions about it. Uh, but he says it's not really functioning at this time, and that to me was not very honest. And he should be more honest to describe that you guys are probably going full bore and trying to figure out exactly how to work with this surveillance tech and all this new four and five G and streetlights. And uh, it's just a matter of you don't quite know what to do with it yet. There's so much of it. So, uh, you know, I, I think you need a much different approach to be more honest about the subject matter. And um, uh, I guess I guess that's that's covers. I, I, I know I have more to say and I can't think of what I 
what, what else I need to say at this time, but uh, just thank you for the meeting today. And uh, yeah, I want to say uh, Rajani, maybe I'll try that Rajani as uh, hopefully I can get this right. And thanks for your patience and me learning how to say your name. Thanks. That was right. Next speaker is Roland. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first thing I'd like to bring to, to your attention is that now we are now nearly three hours into this meeting and I'm still waiting for someone to uh, enable closed captioning. So if that process could be automated, that'd be greatly uh, appreciated. Now, as you heard from uh, many members of the community, um, adequate transportation or lack thereof for all people of all abilities is a serious issue in the city of San Jose. But concerned citizens have to go through endless presentations discussing street sweeping, storm drains, digesters, homeless encampments, and other issues without a clear nexus to transportation issues. So I think that the time has come to um, revisit the, the well intended uh, recommendation by former council member Cortese to merge the transportation and environmental committees and re uh, relegate environmental issues without a clear nexus to transportation to a separate uh, committee to deal uh, with those issues. The last comment I'd like to make with all due respect is that I do hope that the next city manager will consider looking outside the VTA retiree pool for the position of director of transportation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. And our last speaker is calling user one. Please keep it related to transportation and the environment. Oh, don't worry. I'll keep it to the transportation and the environment. Don't you worry. Yeah, yeah. I like the micromanagement uh, on my iPhone from you, Deb. Thanks a lot for uh, letting me know what I'm supposed to talk about in open forum. It sounds real open, doesn't it? I don't know who's left listening, but can you believe these people, what they're doing? Environment? What environment? It, it, you're not going to street sweeping is going to clean up the environment? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, you're worried that, yeah, I mean, next door, I got kicked off the next door, so how am I supposed to know when it's going to happen? My neighbors, like, like I want to like be on some Yahoo chain mail with them? No thanks. Just, you know, put out some flyers, put out some, you know, why don't you go on the news and talk about it instead of talking about uh, the Billy DeFrank Center or whatever you always do. Why don't you, why don't you make some press releases in the spotlight? Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I should be charging you for this because this is, this is actually good consultation. But uh, yeah, I mean, you need to, you, need, you guys need to uh, stop making excuses about everything you think that there's this is going to be some post modern utopia it's not it's san jose california i mean we're still picking prunes here for god's sakes you can't even keep the bathroom clean at the at the rose garden you can't keep the fountain running at the rose garden that place has been around a hundred years you still can't you still can't get it straight dev the, the grass is dying everywhere nice environment over there the trash piled high on the weekends and all, and all the garbage cans. Is that good for the environment and for the people who are around rotting garbage everywhere? It's disgusting. It took forever to fix the broken gate. I'm glad they didn't crush somebody. Seriously, this all this new transit, it's going to be a disaster. Nobody's going to use it. They don't use it now. It's not. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.